You're listening to Find the Good News, Episode 38, The Pizzeria, Mixtape Volume 1, featuring Paul Gonsalon, Rosie Pryor, and Elizabeth McDaniel. This episode of Find the Good News is sponsored by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. Check out our work at parkerbrandup.com. Well, this is the episode that I've been talking about, the first Find the Good News mixtape. I had a lot of fun putting this episode together. It's a fun concept, and I'm really thankful for Paul, Rosie, and Elizabeth. This meeting of local minds couldn't have happened without their willingness to participate. If you're a listener of Find the Good News, then you may have already listened to their individual episodes. If not, this is a great place to start. Most episodes of Find the Good News are one-on-one visits. I do my best in each episode to give you deep dive reflections, my takeaways from the talks that I've had with each guest. Since I've already done that with each of these local good newsies, I'll spare you my drivel. Instead, I just encourage you to enjoy your time with these people. I know I did. And if you want to get to know them on a deeper level, then I'd encourage you to go back and listen to their individual episodes of Find the Good News. With that, I'd say let's get on with it, pop in the Pizzeria Mixtape Volume 1, and press play on some really good news. Wake up this morning, you're dreaming up a story I can hear the way it's going, cause you're laughing in your sleep on the path to your deliverance and a holy wall of light. Old news, bad news, fake news. Sometimes you want to rewind, snip out the best parts, then put them all together. With Find the Good News mixtapes, that's exactly what I get to do by putting good people doing good works together at the same table. On this show, I visited with individuals who are using their creativity, resources, and talents to bring hope and happiness to their corner of the world. Now, we're getting back together to expand on our original conversations. These guests have returned to share even more of their good news with me and to open their hearts and minds to each other. We have elevated discourse about the things going on in our lives, revealing our critical life experiences, perspectives, and the fundamental beliefs that have anchored each to a path of goodness. Every good newsie has a story. Each has good news to share. My name is Oren Parker. I'm mixing and matching my wonderful guests, and we're going to find the good together. And I love you just as well. I don't know how much you guys know about each other, so I would love to start off with just going around the table uh, clockwise, which... You know, you guys know me. I'm not, and the, the, all people who listen to this show have to hear me every single episode, so I'm not going to reintroduce myself. But if you could just, just introduce yourself so people who maybe haven't listened to your episode know who you are. Okay. Um, my name is Rosie Pryor. Uh, I was on the podcast how long ago? Oh, I don't know. Let's ago. see. Well, it's it been a while. Matter. Yeah, it's it's been a while now. Yeah, I feel like it's been a few months at least. It has, but it has. um and I was on here talking about uh my recovery blog. Um I write about my recovery from um alcoholism and addiction and also uh anorexia and bulimia. So it's kind of just a nice uh wide range of topics um but they all they have a lot in common too so i'm very public about it it you know makes some people uncomfortable but then some people are kind of drawn to it because it's um it's i don't know it's honest i try to tell the truth and i think there's a lot of people suffering out there that need to hear it and need to know that they're not alone because that's how when i was kind of in the depths of all my despair um i really would have appreciated knowing that there was somebody out out there that like felt the same way so um i'm also a, a, i just got my uh massage therapist license and so i'm doing that now as well um which kind of has to do with recovery you know it's it's a lot with the self-help and self-care and i've learned a lot um through going to school for that so um that's that's who i am and where i am that's 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 a thank great you. intro. Yes, thank you for sharing. Yes. yes, you're welcome. And the gentleman to your left. Yes, my name's Paul Gonsolin. Um, I work as a counselor 
as a therapist working with drug court and with family and youth counseling agency. I uh, also work as a musician and I play with a band Crybaby, 50s rock and roll and um, a bunch of other people too. Uh, I think I got here through the band and through... Well, it was the band that got me It was me the band here. that got you here. I didn't know it was you. I didn't remember know that. I reached That's out right. to the That's band, right. but we ended up having a whole a different conversation than, yeah. than the band. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, so... What else do you want to know right now, Andy? dude? That's good. That's I think good. we're yeah, we're gonna get in. Everybody's gonna if they haven't listened to y'all's episodes. I just want to make sure they get your voice. If they haven't, they okay. know who's who. So once we start, they won't have a way to tell who's who. Okay. I'm Elizabeth. I am a pharmacist by um, my day life. I teach booty yoga, um, and I'm an ontological coach. Um, so we blend. Um, coach to way of being which we say every human lives in language emotions and body and the intersection of those three is how you move in the world and if you have a breakdown that's happening in your world um it's in relation to those three and how they intersect so um that's a new venture i'm taking on yeah i'm excited that last time i know we talked about as you're it was similar to paul i contacted mm-hmm. you because I, I saw booty yoga but when you got here you, got, you ended up talking a lot about ontology and i didn't know anything about it so i don't think it's interesting the reason I'm doing these mixtapes is because one, I had asked the people that listen to the show, which right now is kind of around the 10,000 listeners mark, which is really awesome. quite a lot for a local show. And that's, that's pooling together a variety of different sources, but you know, that's where we're hanging at. And I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm actually surprised a little bit, but, um, so I kind of polled the listeners, which didn't go as well as I thought people aren't <laughs> responding to polls. Like I thought I was like, this, I'm not getting enough feedback. Um, so I took a new approach after I didn't get the feedback that I was, I thought I was going to get. And I said, okay, maybe, maybe this is just a, happy accident i'm gonna just go listen to these episodes again and see if i can find common threads because that seemed to keep coming up um in the shows the calling it the golden thread that's sort of seeming one guest to the other when i would listen to your three episodes particularly i just kept feeling like there was some kind of common heartbeat going on in there Mm -hmm. and so i thought well maybe that's the way we do this maybe that's the way we do the mixtapes is we go back and we do the greatest hits but i try to find those three guests that kind of are the same yet different you know and so we can see challenge each other and learn some new things and and maybe the listeners can as well i don't know if you i talked to you two and i know i told paul what the premise of this is going to be is a little different because it's like well where do you go because with each of you, I go, okay, well, I don't know, know you very well. I want to, like, dig into you. But we've kind of already done that. So what I thought would be interesting is if I did a little homework on just the episodes and in the spirit of it being a mixtape, mm-hmm. you know, when you're back in the day, you would take songs and you go, like, what's the best songs I want to put together, right, on one tape? So what I did is I went back through all of your episodes and I pulled out three things that each of you said in your episode and then i thought we could play it and we'd all listen to it (laughs) 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 and the audience can listen to it too and then we'll have a discussion about what you said and just see where that goes i mean this is brand new you guys are the first ones i hope to do many of these but uh i don't know i think that would be pretty interesting be fun for sure nothing sensational (laughs) just letting you know there's no sabotage here it's nothing you if you know you said it so uh i say we just jump right in let's just get it going and and, and we'll go in order i think that's how i have it cut together i put it in the order of who appeared first and um let's just see what happens i can't tell you the wailing and weeping that nobody saw my wife didn't see it my children didn't see it something happened during the making of that video particularly and I, and I told her, I said, something's different about this pain. I feel like I'm not supposed to run from it. Like normally you, you stick your hand in a fire, your instincts to jerk it back. Right. This pain, I feel like I should enter it. And by entering it, it's actually surrounding me and doing something good. And I don't know what it is, that but is it's a really chamber. Cool. And I remember calling it uh, the heart chamber. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm entering this wounded, bleeding heart, and I'm supposed to be in here. 
and I don't know why, but when I come out, something's going to be different. So, yeah, I think that's the closest thing I can like. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, that was, that was a really great example. I mean, I, I think if, you know, we do all these things to numb, we do all these things to not feel to run away from it because like you felt that visceral pain, you know, and, um, if you cannot, if you can't feel it, you can't heal it. Yeah. So you right have on. to, you know, you have to. And I didn't make that up. I got well, that still, it's very, very you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, it's not original. But um, you, you just, you have to. And I only say that because I ran from it my whole life, you know. And it was only when I got on the other side of that and embraced a life that, I always knew that was mapped out for me. I always knew I was an addict, like I said. But I, when I got on the other side of that and finally surrendered, like you surrendered, you know, you st- you can actually start to heal. You know, right. you can actually start to see. And, you know, you, you crack your heart open, but it just makes more room to grow. Like, you know, it just makes more room to, to em- embrace other people and, you know, be compassionate and empathetic. So... I, it, it seems like a horrible thing to be in at the time, but you have to do that to move forward and up. Okay. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Paul and I talked about some of that related to that when he and mm-hmm. I had our conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess if I'll just jump in, it seems like... And I listened to this, but it's been a while. But it seems like you're talking about your pain and kind of the value of going into it and what that means. Is that kind of what was going on in that moment? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and as I was listening to you speak, it's like I went into this place and it almost felt like a a sacred thing. Yeah. That's what I like to think about. Yeah. This old kind of pain is like I run from it, but once I'm in there... It's a little bit like, oh, this is a very meaningful and a sacred thing. For me, that means nothing holy or religious, but just that, oh, this is a very special place where something is about to happen. And once this happens, if I can let it, I will be a different person on the other side of this and maybe one that I've been waiting to become for a while. Man, that's pretty eloquently said. Yeah, Yeah. that's very accurate to how I would say I felt when I've been through things that are bigger you know not Mm -hmm. smashing your finger with a hammer but like real deep deep cuts yeah you know and i think we can get caught in the story of like an emotion is good or bad or right or Mm -hmm. wrong and not want to go into those what we call negative emotions Mm -hmm. Um, but there's always learning to be had and what what is it serving you to yeah. go there um so for me to be like a you know in a sad place is negative for me and so i'll try to move and you know do something to get out of it but there's a lot of learning and a lot of growth that can happen if i allow myself to sit in it and appreciate it for what it is and what it's trying to tell me yeah in those moments yeah no i think i can relate to that too and that's in, in retrospect in the moment you know it's not always that clear but in retrospect it's kind of how it seems to be i can say even yesterday just a simple example i was getting a little frustrated with the uh duties i had been tasked with yesterday and i know i could monkey mind i was just feeling frustrated and i was like man i'm really getting frustrated and the more i latched onto that it was different than watching it You know, if I, and I did, I mean, I'm not, I'm not patting myself on the back, but it was like, okay, this is a great moment to like kick into these mental exercises is why you practice is like, I'm feeling frustrated. Why watch it for a second? Oh, you're tired. You're tired. You need some sleep. These thoughts are, yeah, they're real, but they're like super temporary, a little sleep and you're not going to feel this way. And so just having those thoughts about that feeling it didn't take them away, but I could watch it like a show almost, I guess, that I knew eventually was going to end. Does that kind mm-hmm. of make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's that kind of on the surface day to day frustration, which I'm dealing with all the time as well. It seemed like, Rosie, when you were talking, it was a little bit more like I've had this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like this is old stuff that I've known about for a while that I've run from, I think, were your words. Mm-hmm. And so. It's like you knew that already, which I think is really kind of interesting and speaks to 
what must be bravery within you or some kind of willingness to go through that at some point. Well, is that I what mean, you were talking about, or was it different? I think that um, as far as pain goes, it's just. I think it's frustrating, or it was for me to think that all this pain was just kind of for naught, you know, that it was for nothing, that it's just Mm. like, why, why, why? And for years and years and years. And then when you can finally look at it and say, oh, that was just like building me up to the place that I am now. You can't see it when you're in it. That's the, you know, that's the frustration. Um, I'm, I'm like kind of in my head right now because I've, for the past two days, I've just been like really low, you know, like really really low and I cannot, and I'm like, but I'm doing all the right stuff, but Uh, you know, like I don't drink anymore. I don't do drugs. Like I shouldn't be feeling this. Why is it not working? Um, and so I've just been really frustrated and I'm like, what can I do? I can't drink. I can't take a pill. Okay. All I can do is coffee and like go for a run. And sometimes that doesn't do it, you know? So it's almost like even like listening to my words and your words that were just said to me again, it's like I needed to hear that, you know, because, because look at like, just stop and look at it again, stop running because that doesn't even, no matter what it is, like that doesn't, it doesn't work. And it does, um, there is so much value in just sitting with it. Mm. Like that's what none of us can do. Or I mean, uh, maybe y'all can, but yeah. just like sit with it and look at it. Mm-hmm. Even if it's like really scary and ugly and messy and gross or whatever, like just yeah. sit with it, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah. there's so many, even like, I'll be like, well, there's not enough notifications on my Facebook today, you know? And I'll uh, be like, yeah. I don't have enough contact with people. I don't have that dopamine rush. Uh. It's like, golly, you know, just calm down like a hit yeah, like, like i need a hit, hit of, of yes. something and, and it is interesting man that's a whole nother subject but it is interesting how um social media does do that to you even if you're watching it and you're going okay i'm out of that wheel uh i mean i'll give you i mean just god true confession i mean even with this show like i can have all these altruistic ideas about it like what is it for and then if i don't get feedback from a listener and I'm not talking about great show you're doing awesome I'm not talking about that I'm talking about like somebody I'd say every episode I get some kind of message from somebody I mean I look at like all the things you guys do like your posts your blog for instance when somebody I go read your comments I'm like man look at all these people she's really helping people she's they're telling you that even though that's the purpose right Regardless, unless you're like really guarded up in your mind, you're going to get a dopamine hit from those people giving you that praise or compliment. They're going, oh, thank you for falling on your sword for us. Do you know what I'm saying? So then it's like, (laughs) right. And so that's where I am right now. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to. No, God, this is what we're here for. It's awesome. So so I'm at the point now where I'm like, who am I doing this for? And I hate to even say that. Because, you know, it's embarrassing and it doesn't, it doesn't go with what I'm trying to do. I, and it, I want, you know, I want people to know they're not alone, but I also like to know that they like what I'm doing. Yeah. So it's just hard. Yeah. yeah. It's like a catch 22. So it's mirrors. I mean, we need right. these we, we mirrors. I hear this all the time from people, uh, just on this show and just in communication is like, you know, without feedback that that, they don't care about, you know, we get trapped in the mirror that we the literal mirror on the wall, but people are the, are the mirrors, man. That's the one we want to see ourselves back from them. Oh, did you respond positively to me? Are you telling me that that's, that I'm pot, that that's positive. We've had a positive engagement. That's difficult because our identity comes back to us mm-hmm. through these people. And if some, well, I mean, I know for me, like if I'm in a conversation and I feel that energy stalling out, I start to feel like they're not interested in this. They're not, they don't, they don't want to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. Am I doing something? I'm not communicating properly. I'm not putting the right words out there. Do I not know enough to stimulate the, the conversation? It's all just running like static mm-hmm. somewhere in there. Even if I can't verbalize it later, it's there. It starts to, make calloused words, you know, that I can go, oh, these are the thoughts that I'm having while this is going on. I don't know. It's difficult. I, I, can, I bet in, in your situation, similar to this one, I put a show out and I get two or three messages, like long letters, and I go, man, that's what I wanted. Not the message, but to know somebody out there heard something that they related to. 
and they most of the time it's I thought I was the only one who thought this, or oh, I thought I was all alone, or oh, I had these worries too. Thank goodness somebody said it. Mm-hmm. Whether it's me or somebody on the show, that kind of feedback, honestly, it's fuel to keep going. But when I don't get that fuel, I get the same sort of feelings, and it's weird. It's all and it's social because without social media, that doesn't happen. You don't get that feedback. There's no platform for it unless somebody's going to actually lick a stamp and send you a letter or call you. You're not going to get that. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of why I feel like, um, you know, like counseling and therapy and all that stuff. When you actually have contact with somebody, to me, it lasts longer. Like the feeling mm. of the connection that you actually have with like the face to face person. Mm-hmm. To me, I don't know. I, I feel like that leaves more of an imprint. And I, I like when I go to my outpatient therapy, you know, three nights a week or whatever, I see the people there. I kind of vibe off their energy and I leave feeling like, ah, oh, like on fire, whatever, at nine o'clock at night. And I call my husband and I'm like, hey, da, da, da. yeah, he's like, oh, you're so annoying right now. Like, I'm just trying to sleep. <laughs> you know, like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I just like out with the coolest people. So um, I think there's something about face to face that we lose in the you know the button clicking and yeah and all that stuff. No, I agree. I think so too. Even reading, I don't know. It's this age that we live in with this. So you can put information out there so quickly, little short thoughts. And I'm kind of in this place with that kind of communication where I'm like, I'm either going to put out really long content or I'm going to put out really short content because uh, just banter. I'm just not interested in that. I'm like, mm-hmm. no. I'm either going to put out a really at least a paragraph of thought, something that a, a solid feeling that I've fleshed out or a, a, anything, an idea, or I'm going to scale it back to just something really simple that can be just mysterious and simple. Hmm. I don't want to do, you know, like KPLC comments, not to throw them under the bus, but I mean, just, I don't, I don't want that, that mm-hmm. that's not, it's not elevated conversation to any degree. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you, like I, we would, I would say that all that's feedback, you know, it's feedback you're getting from people. Um, but it's real important to know like where your come from is and yeah. to not get stuck in the stories. I mean, you were te- saying all these stories that you create, if you get feedback from people, positive or negative yeah. and what it allows you to do and how much we get caught up in stories and yeah. what that allows us to live or not do, do or not do in our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and how important it is to know like you're come from and where you stand and, and you know what you're trying to get out of it so you can stay centered in all of that and say you know this is my driver this is what's driving me and mm-hmm. this is why i'm doing it and you know their feedback can be positive or negative i can take it or i cannot take it but you know this is what i'm doing yeah for me the thing that stood out from what you said is well, something like one of the most painful things that i've endured is the idea that all the pain i'm going through has no meaning Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um we've talked about this and one of the things that i've read and just kind of know is that pain is a certainty (laughs) right that's the end of that statement right there (laughs) right it's a certainty so if i'm gonna deal with the pain of being alive whatever that may be for a different person and the comments on social media, I need to know why I'm doing that stuff. Yeah. And if I do, I'm moving in my valued direction. This is what I want to do. I want to put out a podcast that affects people in a positive way. I imagine you get comments of all range. I do, mostly, right. yeah. yeah. So you have a meaning and a purpose behind that, and I imagine that, that makes it easier for you to deal with things like negative comments, if we call them that, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. If you didn't have that, I imagine it would be more difficult. Sure, you could get wrapped up in that. I mean, that goes back to that mirror thing. And I mean, it's I think it's a good way to look at it. I mean, you can get wrapped up in your own reflection in the literal mirror. Especially if it's only about the reflection. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. It's true. I mean, if I'm go if I were do if you're doing a show like this or whatever activity, I mean, we're all doing things that affect people's lives, right? I mean, each mm-hmm. one of us at the table and to whatever degree and through whatever vehicle we're using. But yeah, if you're doing those things because you for the feedback, mm-hmm. then that's not 
gonna ever it's gonna uh, to me that's just a sugar castle it's gonna dissolve in a cup of coffee yeah you know? I, I imagine rosie you don't do your blog for your own glorification because i've read it a few times yeah, it doesn't, really, doesn't really paint a pretty picture <laughs> right so yeah. there's a little there's something more behind that and i imagine you get comments of all ranges as well and i do sometimes mm as well <laughs> and that can be difficult if the reasons why i'm doing something aren't there yeah or, or aren't in yeah. line with what i value that's a good point what about you when you're doing like your i mean because like your classes are fat your booty yoga i mean going yeah. into that i mean people you're putting videos and content out yeah there i'm putting all the time. out and you know there's times where there's no one in class or there's one or two people in class and so i've definitely had those conversations like i'm not doing things right or people aren't into it and so i've i've had to have these conversations with myself and why am i doing this i'm teaching booty because i love it mm -hmm. because it helps me in my own personal journey and growth to get out of my head and into my body and fully experience um all the things that it has to offer um you know we're not it's not choreographed, so I have to go in there and just completely let myself go. And as I'm a pharmacist, a super type A personality, that's, you know, opposite of my history. And I'm happy. I know it. If you're like me, then you've got a long wish list of things you need to do around your house. Things you just can't get to. It's not that I don't want to do them, but between my responsibilities at work, producing this show, and squeezing in some valuable mental downtime, I can't seem to get around to fixing the small stuff, and the big stuff is just waiting in line. To be honest, it kind of stresses me out. Maybe you're stressing out too. Well, stress no more because I've got good news. My friend Ben Von Duke has started a handyman service and he takes the mystery out of getting these things done. Ben Von Duke is not just some guy that calls himself handy. He knows what he's doing and he knows a whole lot. Not only is he an experienced and professional carpenter, but he's kind of a duke of all trades. What I love is that he's created an a la carte price list of services so you don't have to worry about getting in your pockets too deep before you're ready. He'll fix your running toilet, install appliances, replace fixtures, install ceiling fans, repair sheetrock and concrete, and a whole lot more than that. Look, I'm not too proud to say this, but sometimes it takes me three times as long to fix something because I've got to get online and search videos just to figure out what tools I need. Then I have to go buy the tools that I don't have and then kind of sort of come home and do the job. I don't have to do that anymore because Ben Von Duke will do it and do it better. On top of all that, he's just a good person, someone you can trust. He's honest, he's kind, and those are things that I value highly, and I bet you do too. You can get a hold of Ben Von Duke, the Duke of all trades, the good old fashioned way, by using the phone. Call or text Ben at 337 540 1355. That's 337 540 1355. He'll send you his service and price list, and trust me, his prices are more than fair. And do me a favor. When you do message Ben at 337-540-1355, tell him you heard about the Duke of All Trades on Find the Good News. I just came to the realization that I'm doing this for me to help me and I love it and I want to share it with as many people as possible and if someone shows up and I get to share it with them then that's great but if no one's there then then that's okay too you know it's not that I'm doing anything wrong or we're just not connected with that person on that day and um, just realize that it's, I'm doing it for me and hoping to bring as many people into it as I can and that they can get the experiences that I have, but it, that's not my driver, mm -hmm. you know? I keep, I hear something that has popped up when you were talking and it's something you just said, the opposite of my history. Uh, and you said something earlier too, that kind of, I think relates where you said, um, when I'm not getting that feedback or I'm not getting those likes or whatever, or, or no, that isn't what it is. You were talking about, I'm doing all the stuff and I'm not getting the result. I'm not feeling like I'm not getting that hit. I'm not getting where I think I need to be, you know, but I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And I keep thinking of alchemy, you know, how we're trying to turn lead into gold, but we get caught up in the process of alchemy where it's like, where's the gold? Where's the gold? Where's the gold? I keep doing the stuff and I keep getting lead. And it's like chasing after the shiny thing, you know? 
and and I also wonder about be it the opposite of your history. I don't know. That to me just I can think is kind of fascinating because I think we could all hear that at some point in our life where you where people that you've known for maybe a large chunk of your life they they engage with you a certain way, they're used to seeing you a certain way, they're used to you speaking a certain way and then if you have a change in your life and you start dialing things in differently because you're going, "Oh wait, I think I might I think I'm starting to see my true face finally." After a long time, I want to show that face to people. I don't want to keep showing people this other face that they're used to, this identity that they, Oren Parker graphics designer, Oren Parker Parker brand, Oren Parker guy behind the video camera. So many people only know me as that person. Mm -hmm. Partly that's my fault because I didn't share the person that I thought I, that I, that I think I am or Mm -hmm. that I prefer to be with them. I wasn't making the effort to do that, but when I engage with them, it's strange because I have to kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of going off here, but it's like that identity almost wants to come back on and like, okay, now you're, this person knows you as, you know, copywriter, marketing plan, design. So that's where we're going into. You need to put on this kind of face right now, right? Because they're, that, that comforts them. That's what their, their engagement with you is. But there's this other me who's wearing a barrel with a tin cup going alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And I got birds in my hat, you know, and I'm going, there's this me that's a little more who I know I really am. But I'm still wearing the wearing that identity suit when I go in there because it comforts them. Hmm. Is that my own fault? I guess is what I'm saying is I'm going, I've got this other history But this person I really am is sort of the opposite of the history that everybody knows. And and I guess this show is kind of that way. It's like, hey, I'm finally showing this side, right? I'm putting it out there. But these engagements still exist out in the world because not everybody's listening to the show. I don't know. I guess that's a little bit of a struggle. Do you? Do anybody ever struggle with anything like that, where you have old engagements or old relationships that they don't really, they haven't taken the time or you haven't put the effort into putting that out there? That's like the opposite of your history. Mm-hmm. Who's going first? Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> I sure didn't Me? put that out there too eloquently. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, here's a strange experience that I have meeting up with someone who sees me, um, seeing myself through someone else's eyes who knew me when I was in high school, for example. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they haven't known me since. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I see myself through them looking at me, but like who I used to be. Yeah. Really weird. Yeah, and that, that uh, old mirror, like a time machine mirror. You're like, oh, that's who I, that's uh, who they see. I, I was happy when I left that person behind. <laughs> that yeah. version of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And here he is again. So that's an experience that I have. Um, I thought it was like kind of special and unique that like, oh, I've become a few different people in the past 15 years. Yeah. But it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, everybody does that about every ten years. I just learned that recently. Okay, here you go. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're, we're we're not that special. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have the information, so that's nice. Um, but no, I I've, I can tell you maybe th- three versions of myself that have happened in you know fifteen years, and the people who know me well, they know about each one of those, and they can see how they inform one another how music informs therapy someone who doesn't though kind of like you're saying if somebody knows me through music there are those people who have no idea what my day job is yeah and i don't really want them to know and yeah. that's uh, i'm hiding a little bit but i don't know maybe it's you're good with that to just go hey this is this this is sort of this what i'm doing right now i don't know if i'm good with it or not i don't spend much time with it if you're asking me i would say I think I'm I think I'm good with it. Yeah, yeah. if you're going to say that. Um, they're two different worlds and they're strange. But someone who does know me quite well or knows the ins and outs of therapy and music can see how they work together and how a therapy session is a lot like showing up and playing music with a total stranger for the first time. And those things work very well together. So for me, my hats make sense on their own hat rack yeah i got you i can imagine someone who doesn't know me that well being like "Mm, that's a strange fit and so 
for those kind of interactions we're just on the surface with it and that's fine i can relate to that too because i'm a pharmacist and most people Mm. here know since i've moved back only know me as a yoga instructor and so how people come in and are they're like you're a pharmacist i had no idea you know or and i don't talk about pharmacy really outside um of being in the pharmacy so it's interesting to have like the yoga people see me in the pharmacy setting or vice versa to see like patients that come to me and then see me out Mm -hmm. you know and like booty clothing or you know whatever that is it's a worlds are colliding yeah but to me like you said it makes sense you know like all the you know for me ontology is language emotions and body yoga is the body medicine you know sort of the biochemistry plays Mm -hmm. into that i'm you know so it makes sense in my journey yeah at least (laughs) i I do find that it's fun when somebody asks me about it and we talk about it a little bit it's fun for me to like elaborate on how they're similar but yeah it's funny and a little bit awkward sometimes when the worlds collide for the first time. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I have experiences like that for sure. I think most of that's of my own making though. Mm. I mean, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I, I have this running under underlying message that's built in. It seems like for me where I just want people to treat each other better in all aspects. Mm. It just immediately and that's that's me wanting the world to be fair i think and i know it's not i'm not a fool in that regard but i just go when i'm in a meeting where i've got on the advertising hat and someone's being cruel or just unkind i have a very difficult time because the other the real i'm going to call it the real quotey fingers me whatever that means is underneath that veneer that 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 advertising hat going wanting to like come out and go put put a hand on that person and just go we don't have to talk like this we don't have to do this to each other i know we're in a marketing meeting and i know this is what everything's saying to do it's okay to just not be that right now when you feel i just want there's this part of me that just wants to leak out into Mm -hmm. that world so bad and i have this other part of me that goes that continues to play the game though and says well yeah but this isn't the time or the place and i'm starting to find that that's not as easy as i thought it was going to be as i get older and older that little veil between those two is getting thinner and thinner you know partly again i hate to keep saying it's partly why this show was born it was like okay these tools all the stuff we're doing I think it's time to maybe use some of that and just go ahead and have a format for it to leak out because mm-hmm. if it doesn't it's going to start leaking out in those meetings and in those places if it doesn't come out somewhere mm-hmm. i don't know interesting but um so you were the next guest elizabeth okay we're gonna go into the next clip <laughs> let's see what you said or what we talked about I mean, really, that's what it's about. It's it's connecting, and that's what what's been lost. I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that what you're doing with that, and uh, other people are doing, really in the community, is exactly what I'm looking for. I mean, people want to connect with other people and i think in connecting with other people we start just like you said we start to see those common things and we Mm -hmm. start to go oh i'm actually okay it's okay to be a little this or a little that or maybe that anxiety i have isn't so strange after all or my fear is someone else's fear and not that you want the fear to grow but sometimes when you get the camaraderie that fear doesn't have a home to hide in anymore you know well one of the biggest lessons i got from going through the course initially my coaching course um was the walls that we show up with, you know? And I had really bad social anxiety. And so once I realized that like, everyone was showing up with the same walls and it was just because of the things that, the vulnerabilities that they were trying to hide, once you realize they were all showing up with that and it's like, if we can take those walls away and just connect, you know, um, personally, how much more our relationships can grow. So we start off the weekend, um, the first EFL weekend is like a Friday through a Sunday. Um, And one of the first things they have us do is stand face to face with someone you've never met, like, face to face and it's the most uncomfortable thing and you step by by the end of the weekend you're doing the same thing and giving everyone hugs and not feeling uncomfortable at all yeah. and the only difference that happened between friday and sunday was conversation mm. that's the only thing there's n- nothing more than that and so if you can just take that approach with people and just realize we're the same person i just want to get to know you i'm not going to try and put up any fake layers or walls of what you th- yeah. what i think you want to see or what i think i'm supposed to look like if i just know who i am and can be from that space and can connect with you from your space then mm. 
beautiful thing. Well, that's interesting because it kind of leads and that kind of makes me feel like what I was talking about. Well, that's it's funny that that's the clip you played because I was about to say, talk about that again, just because um, that's what it reminded me of. You know, we have all these walls that we put up. I remember actually being in a restaurant post this workshop and before I would have had so much social anxiety just standing there, like waiting to be seated. And I remember looking around and just being aware of everyone and not, not having that and only... The only difference was is that I be, let myself be vulnerable that weekend. And so it um, realizing that everyone's showing up with some walls or some story or some standard, like you you know, you were saying that they I should be this way because they perceive me this way, that's some standard that you have that you think that you should live up to. Um, if you can take that away and just be who you authentically are and we could all show up that way, we could just connect so much easier. Yeah. It's easier said than done, though. It is. We say things, you know, we always say, um, it's simple, not easy. You know, it takes lots of practice. Um, yeah. n no way have I perfected any of these things. You know, I'm a work in progress. Um, when I started this work, uh, I don't know, about six years ago, I, resentment was a real big um, underlying emotion that was there. And I was like, oh, I got that down. And then at the end of last year, I realized, no, there's still like some resentment that's like bubbling under the surface. And even six years post that. Yeah. initial training so it's always like working at it and just acknowledging it and observing what's going on and and seeing where you're coming from that's something i had struggled with for a long time because i and i still i guess to some degree do was when you said resentment i thought oh, gosh all, it's all this stuff lit up in my head because people that i admire and teachings that i really try to follow and practices that, that i really do try to follow or use as like a ship to guide my life call you to forgive people and to, and to really struggle with resentment and harboring ill feelings towards others and so for a long time i was in sort of like this pendulum swinging state where i would go i'm not supposed to resent them they're not supposed to they're not they're not supposed to love my enemy and just, you know name it what <laughs> from whatever philosophy you're pulling from there's some version of that there and so when i would have those feelings i raged against them i would go no and i would just really get down on myself for having the feeling now what's changed is you know i knew now i know that was really hot and cold i was never going to balance out so now I, I allow it kind of like the other things we were talking about I just go okay i have this resentment i have this feeling i'm just going to allow it but i'm not going to act out of it mm -hmm. you know i'm just going to let the feeling come up but i don't want to stay in that thing because that stuff just it got so poisonous for me it is it really is probably with some of the worst poisons in me when I allow those things to drive my actions or stay inside my or leave my thoughts too long, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's what we were talking like good or bad, you know, that no emotion really is good or bad or right or wrong. You know, resentment, you know, can, can be on the far end, you know, anger and, you know, all of this rage that you see, but also on the other end gives you the energy to protect your family if they, if they need, right. you know, so there's a wide range in that, but it's just being aware of, Hey, I noticed this for me now. It's like I noticed this sensation in my body or I'm behaving in this way. That's maybe a little bit of resentment showing up. Like, how can I adjust that? And just being aware that it's there and not letting it driving me. Yeah, that fascinates me too. chemicals in the body. That's something for a long time. I totally just for, would forget that was even going on. I would always just go, oh, this always happens when I get in this situation, something physical in the last several months. Um, I ended up in a pretty negative altercation with somebody and it was just tr it, it, everything I'm talking about just it was right in that category it challenged it put all my beliefs into practice everything I think I know into practice and it was also you know stimulating all that stuff in my body and so and then it ultimately ended up in sort of like a very heated unfortunate face-to-face -face conversation and I remember it had been a long time since that had happened in my life where I was like, wow, these things still happen. Even if you're doing all this stuff, just like you said earlier, even if I'm doing everything I think I'm doing right, when the rubber meets the road, when these types of things happen, I have no control over what that person's doing. They're not, they're not doing any of this stuff I'm doing. So they're in a totally different place in this engagement now. And here I am having this negative engagement and I'm going, okay. What can I put into practice here? What can I put into practice here? Nothing's working. This is just staying led. And then all of a sudden, 
my body gets hot, I start sweating, my right leg starts just shaking like a leaf, tears start coming out of my eyes. I'm like, oh, my adrenaline's kicking in because it's protect. Mm -hmm. It's trying to kick, you know, it's putting me in this mode. And so I'm going, so now my brain's getting affected by all this. It's very strange Mm -hmm. when you're observing it versus Mm -hmm. just in the past. I mean, 10 years ago, I would just been like in the thing and I wouldn't have been noticing it. It would have been later to be aware of that happening in the moment was such a strange thing. I mean, I went home and told my wife, I said, God, this is I, let me let me sit down and just talk to you about this. Mm-hmm. Like all this, the thoughts that kick in, the way my body's reacting. It's great stuff. Just wild. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get the privilege of working with an anger management group in my job, and this is something we go through a lot. Really? What does my body do whenever yeah. something comes up for me? And like you're saying, if I can notice that as it's happening, then I have an opportunity to do something a little bit different or for me to connect, like mm-hmm. we're saying here. I would like to share with you that when you do this thing, I start to feel blood rush to my arms and tears are coming down my eyes right now. And I'm not really sure what's happening, but I just want to share that with you and hopefully try to connect right now instead of doing something else. Yeah. And now we're connecting through our sensations Mm -hmm. and I was able to report that to you that's different than I threw a chair through the wall I noticed 30 minutes after that that my blood was all over the place you're like recounting I mean this is I literally I thought this is funny I mean it's like you were there because I literally said to the person in front of me I said dude I'm here try I want this to be peaceful I said but if you will look at me and I mean I said that I said I my eyes I mean it was just like there's pouring out of the corners of my eyes and I said I pointed to my right leg and my foot it was just and I said this is adrenaline and I was like that means something like we've got to stop this Mm. and so I went home and I thought just what you said I thought man how many violent things happen in our world because we're Mm. not doing this kind of work i mean like stopping ourselves and watching the mind body connection and i think for the coaching that i do the body piece is such an important component because we're so unaware of our body but once you can connect to that and then you can be have awareness of what's happening and you can make shifts at Mm -hmm. that point that's where the real magic happens because um our bodies are not disconnected from our emotions. You know, it's a biochemical process. They physically yeah. live there. You can't get away from it. So even though you want to suppress it, suppress it, suppress it, it's going to show up in your body right. somehow. I think that's what's so cool about the both of you and your bringing yoga to people. It's like, yeah. for me, that puts people in touch with my body and my emotions. And then it's like, I think even just through that, you're getting so much closer to your emotions. Mm-hmm. Even if we never even talk about it. Because... I'm so in tune with my sensations Mm -hmm. and I'm always working on that when I'm working with emotional awareness and stuff like that. And listening to your podcast and um, the meditation that you do, I mean, that's really important too, just Mm -hmm. to get to the center of where you are and where you're, you know, we were talking about what I was talking about before of um, getting rid of those walls and knowing where you're come from places and what's at the core of of you and what your drivers are, Mm -hmm. you know, and that ties in, that's complete body awareness if you're not yeah. Talking for- and there's so much that just lives right under the surface mm-hmm. of my conscious brain. Mm-hmm. And so it's just really exciting to get underneath that sometimes and see what happens. Is, do we, I just want to ask, I mean, do you guys all meditate? Do you meditate, Rosie? I used to. What did that look like for you? I mean, because everybody's got a different. Well,. It was kind of funny, like, uh, I went to yoga training in India, and um, it was kind of like a backwoods thing. I don't I don't know if it was even on the map where we were, but it was like the cheapest, you know, thing I could find. Um, and uh, she, the lady gave us all, like, uh, the trainer gave us all the spe- specific mantras to us, and we were like, okay, this is sacred it's a secret and she's like you can never share it with anyone else <laughs> okay so yeah. we're like oh wow you know so we all like it's we finished the training it was a month you know of intense training and then we all go out one night and we're drunk and you know somewhere in india and uh we're like all right tell me what your uh what was your oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so i was like what is 
you know, I just, I, I was kind of like ruined for it. For I get it. Yeah. While, I've but... been involved with things like that too, where it was like, it's secret whenever everybody, everybody has all these rules. And then all of a sudden a month later after the retreat or whatever, you start hearing everybody's junk. And I'm like, well, this kind of breaks the mm-hmm. rules of the retreat that we all held so sacred, you know, mm-hmm. it's disappointing. It's, yeah, take um, you out of it. But I did. I've done like a transcendental meditation uh, course before. Um, it, it's just it's hard, and I could come up with any excuse. If I didn't have kids, I'd find something else to mm, you know. That's honest. But, I mean, um, I, I, yeah, I like but you know, right now my kids. If I wake up, our house is so you know to where everybody can hear in every room. If I wake <laughs> up at four in the morning, my daughter's going to be like. Can I have some milk? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm just like, no. Yeah. They so, know you're awake. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm not a very good person to ask about meditation. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, it's honest. I think you just said something that kind of hits with me. And I, I, y'all haven't heard this yet, but I talked about it on another podcast. I said, you know, I try to build rituals for myself that I can touch easily because I'd read somewhere, and I think it was in the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, and he was saying, you know, you don't bring um meditation to your life you bring your life to your meditation to where so mm-hmm. it you know how it doesn't have to be like this is how i meditate and i have to do this right here mm-hmm. right now and if the circumstances aren't exactly right meditation sort of a broad word mm-hmm. you know but if you're going to do it make it to where it's something that can just like insert in different ways sort of be malleable and flexible so that's helped me because i'm an, i i can relate a lot to what you're saying cuz my son knows when I'm trying to have quiet time somehow I don't know how he knows but he does and and he's a kid and so I've tried to I try to take make that the meditation so if he comes out I go outside in the mornings I have this bowl of sand and you know I've, I've gotten to where what I do instead of lighting candles is I light an instant stick incense stick and then I put it in the sand and then I, I sit with that for a while with those thoughts and then just let them go away and I, if I have time to do that that's great But what's happened is he likes fire and he knows that I'm out there doing that. And he's like, well, dad's got those matches out there. I'm going to come on out there. And he gets out there and he starts like, dad, I want to light some incense. For long, I got 10 incense sticks. All that sacred stuff I'm trying to build in is like, ha ha, that ain't happening. Now this whole tube of incense is burning and then he's striking matches. And so, you know, it blows the whole thing. Mm. I could, that actually could become a source of great frustration if I let it. And so what I've tried to do is go, well, maybe this is the meditation. Mm-hmm. This is a great place to practice is right here where yeah. I'm trying to make something Unless sacred. Unless your house and catches on fire. <laughs> well, I'm just, yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we work with something called mindfulness. One particular kind of psychotherapy that I like is called ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. And a huge part of that is mindfulness practice. And there's a little piece of that that's different than quote-unquote meditation which would be we're sitting down for an hour or 20 minutes we're working with a mantra we're working with our breath whatever mindfulness is more like going into my sensations any one of however many we have five is it is it five <laughs> someone please correct yes, me if yes, I'm wrong. Yes, i don't yes, know yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's five vision uh, uh touch sensations hearing sensations so If I go out to my sandbox and I was going to do a a thinking meditation type deal, but someone comes in anyways or somebody asks me for some milk, maybe I can (laughs) use um, my vision to really focus in on the sensation of seeing smoke leave while that person's lighting a match. Or I'm pouring milk and I'm hearing milk go into the glass. Oh. And yeah. so any sensation that I can get access to, we would call that mindfulness. Um, some people have a tough time driving and anxiety. Mm. You know, so we can go mindfulness while driving. I feel my hands on the steering wheel. Mm. I feel myself where I touch the seat I'm sitting in. These are mindfulness practices. So just like in a thinking meditation, my attention is going to go elsewhere in like two seconds. But I'm just going to bring it back to whatever sensation I was using. And now I have a, a mindfulness practice. It's very interesting because this isn't, it's kind of related, but uh, we're talking a lot about our minds today. And I told Paul before y'all had got here today that I had been awake for 24 hours yesterday. I had to drive for my something my son was doing. And last night... Uh, I don't even know what day it was. Yeah, yesterday, around 11 o'clock, 
I realized I was going to be, I was hitting that point where I was like, yeah, okay, I've still got four more hours, you know, of driving now and I've got to be alert. I've got people in my care. I was really starting to worry because I didn't have a choice. I had to drive. There was no option here. Last night around three o'clock, I was like, oh man, I'm really, I'm getting to that stage now where I, I'm drifting. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I was like, I was watching the miles going, how far away from sulfur am I? And I was doing similar things to what you're talking about. And I was just kind of fascinated by what goes on because you're going, okay, I'm consciously, I'm awake, right? I'm conscious. I am going to feel my steering wheel. I'm going to do all these things, kind of like draw in other sensations instead of just these yellow lines in front of me, which are just like asking you to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. But what's weird is how. It's like there's this other program when you get uh, tired that just goes, I don't care what you do, I'm taking you. Mm. You're done. Like, And I could feel it last night. It was getting dangerous. I think that's fascinating, though, because it's kind of how I feel like though what you're talking about whenever somebody's trying to interrupt that peace time. It's like, even the stuff you're doing... <laughs> I'm taking it. It's coming. Mm-hmm. You're going to do all of this, and it doesn't matter. I'm going to wreck it. And I say I like it's an entity, but you know, I don't know. I, I think that is, I think mindfulness does help, but I wonder if there isn't like just a threshold where you're just going, this just ain't happening. Hmm. I mean, there's just too many distractors. And I wonder if that's just not the, how the world is sometimes too, day to day where we're going, man, I want to be more mindful. I want to touch things in a sacred way, or I want to engage the world differently. But man, there's a lot of people striking matches and asking for milk. Mm-hmm all around <laughs> you know that's hard so what what how, what do you do in that situation do you just say ah oh, well you know and throw your hands up or do you just keep practicing and then hopefully it's it's stronger the next time there's an onslaught like that for me this is a really vipassana kind of thing because a distraction to call it a distraction you're already losing a ah, battle yeah. you're done you're toast okay. done you've identified it yeah. you've identified an aversion to what you're calling a distraction yeah, and and the, the like as you push a distraction away, that is the distraction coming back at you with equal force. Yeah, <laughs> right, you're right. And that is you not being able to disconnect from your quote unquote distraction. Mm, yeah. So it's really I'm hearing an aversion to whatever I'm going through, and the more that I resist going to sleep while driving at three in the morning, the more I will want to go to sleep. Yeah. And that probably seems like a really big paradox, but. It's more like disconnecting from the battle of distraction versus whatever you might call the other thing, peace mm. or whatever it is you're after. And I'm happy. I know you're driving down the road. Everything is going just fine. You're listening to the new episode of Find the Good News in Your Car, and you're all stoked about trying out this zipper merge thing you've been hearing about when all of a sudden you hear that sickening tap on your windshield that's just a little too loud. I've got some bad news for you. You've just got yourself a rock chip. Unfortunately, I've got some worse news. If you don't take care of that rock chip, it's going to turn into a crack. But I do have some good news too. You don't have to have a rock chip or a crack because I've got a way for you to take care of it ASAP. If you go to ASAPGlassCo.com right now, you can stop that chip from winding across your windshield like the Calcasieu River. I used to be terrible about getting a rock chip, saying I'll take care of that later, and then later turns into this irritating crack that just spreads from one side of my windshield to the other. I should have taken care of it ASAP by scheduling a repair with ASAP Glass. ASAP Glass is local, right here in Sulphur, Louisiana, and they're mobile. Even better, you can get a quote right from your mobile phone at ASAPGlassCo.com. ASAP Glass is owned and operated by two of my best friends, lifelong friends, Dan and Kayla Smith. Dan the Glass Man will make sure his team of glass technicians gets to your job ASAP and make sure it's done right so you can keep that windshield crack out of sight. If you do get that rock chip and you don't take care of it ASAP, that's okay. ASAP Glass does complete windshield replacements. Remember, ASAP Glass is mobile, so you don't have to worry about finding time to drop your vehicle off at their shop. You get your quote at ASAPGlassCo.com. Make your appointment with Kayla, and then before long, an ASAP Glass van is on its way to your location. That's it. I know you're probably looking at a rock chip right now. Don't wait. Take care of it ASAP. 
Go to ASAPGlassCo.com on your mobile device and get a quote. That's ASAPGlassCO.com. And make sure to tell Dan and Kayla you heard about ASAP Glass on Find the Good News. That kind of jumps into the body, too. Well, when I was going to... For me, like language is what I picked up on that too. Like the language we use is so powerful. And so like you, you mentioned, I want to do this. Uh, yeah. um, and I'm reading a book called The Path to Surrender. And he talks about um, desire specifically. And especially in Western culture, we say that we desire this or, you know, that's just how we're brought up. But desire connotates something that I don't have mm-hmm. that I want. And so you're already setting yourself up for failure to say, I desire this. Yeah. And that's not really how the universe works. Like you say, I choose this. And then, then let it be. And so it's just that shift and not, not fighting whatever that distraction is or saying I choose to have more meditation in Since my life. I'm hearing what you're saying and it's interesting. It gets off into another subject that I, I get into a lot when I, uh, with a lot of people is the word I itself is that in, to me, I hear I've, I have already identified and made a thing by even saying I. Hmm. I mean, you can go off into that yeah. territory too, because I've, it's a I've hole. yeah, you can get kind of radical for a lot of people, and, and I find sometimes I have to watch myself, me, I, uh, in the conversations I have, because I can get off into a land of the I and what is it, and we can stay there for a long time having that conversation, mm-hmm. uh, and I find it dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Because I have that conversation with myself a lot. I'm not not in a destructive way, but I do find it fascinating. I mean, I'm reading right now uh, the other shore by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's his um, reflections on the Heart Sutra, which is a sutra that is uncomfortable for a lot of people because it's about being and non-being and about the components of things, and that all of the things that make up us are empty. And a lot, and the, it uses the word emptiness a lot, and that word is very. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable be, because it says, "Well, then what? What matters if everything's empty? Then why do anything at all? Why does anything matter?" Sort of nihilistic. And so, he he even mentions that in the book that he said, you know, the reason he wanted to do these a new translation is because that word in Western culture comes across wrong a lot of times. It doesn't translate properly. It pro- translates as emptiness. Just so much more to that word from. I guess a Buddhist perspective, but I don't know. I'm fascinated by that. You know how to break apart these components and go, okay, well, what is the I? And one of the things that he says is, well, the I is an agreement. And I was like, okay, now I'm getting on board with this. When I say me and I say, I, it's an agreement I've made that all of these things, my history, my family's history, all the things that's happened to me, the things I encounter every day that have made the I, the me, the or, and that I see in the mirror, is something that I've agreed to call me. I own a car. I agree that the all of these things have I am this, but I'm not I don't I shouldn't be caught in this identity hmm. and just say, well no, I exist. I am me. I am. Hmm. Okay? And I'm solid and unchanging. Are you? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's like an agreement where you say these things. You have to it's a handshake you're having with yourself. But re- in reality, if you start breaking it out, that that starts to fall apart really quickly Hmm. you know a lot of who we are is things that have happened to us things we remember things that happened to us that were out of control before we were born you know and you can just keep drilling back and i think that's pretty fascinating oh yeah super fascinating Hmm. Uh, there's a movie with will smith in it i I think it's the pursuit of happiness but there's this one line that like sparked off a whole line of thinking for me and they go into maybe it's the wrong movie but will smith is in a hospital bed he needs to accept some kind of treatment somebody comes in and they say your body has rejected the treatment and it occurred to me to ask who's the him that's rejecting the treatment oh that's seven pounds i think seven pounds yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so if my movie, body's yeah. reject rejecting a treatment what part of me is it that's rejecting the treatment does that make any sense mm-hmm. yeah yeah there's a me in there that isn't my body is what that <laughs> yeah. line suggests mm-hmm. which yeah. is really interesting and at the bottom of a long meditation retreat is an experience where i cease to exist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's why i went there and super fun super uh-huh. super fun but can be scary yeah i think for some people but for me it's just a blast because oh at last, I am free from all of these thoughts and all of these things that I've been wanting to be free from yeah. for a long time. It's nice. This reminds me of 
of what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's kind of what you were saying there about having, I guess, a desire for something. You know, sometimes mm. I, I, when I, and again, I, every time I, and I, this is a problem because I say the word I, we all say the word I a lot. But I remember my speech teacher in high school, she would catch us and teach us to stop saying and and um. And if you did it, she was like, nope, start over. And you go, oh man, I gotta start over again <laughs> because she was trying to break that mm-hmm. habit of filling the space with these ums. And and so even to this day, after this 25 years ago, I hear and when somebody's saying and dumb, <laughs> it, it just comes out, you know, it's like a splinter. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I'd stop saying it. And that's all I can hear. That's what's happened to me in the last several months since I started reading that Heart Suture again and thinking about this. That word, I, me, it's like it starts like echoing. And I'm like, man, even that becomes a problem, mm-hmm. you know, because now I've got this, I've latched on to this thing. And now the idea of the I and the idea of me is now a thing. And I've got to, I've, I've made it a little object to pay attention to. And so it's become like a noise almost. So I guess it's, it's almost like it's trying to break. It's trying to wash that out somewhere. It's, I don't know. It's, it's mm-hmm. pretty wild stuff. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Yeah, it makes me think of in yoga, we have the koshas they talk about. And so you start the most external, you know, like your physical body and your breath body, your emotional body, um, your learning body. And at the core of that is the Ananda Maya, which is your bliss body, which is who you are at the core, you know. So it makes me think of that getting rid of the I, the ego, like who you are at the base, which I think probably gets into your meditation as well. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of all those extra layers and who we are at the center. It's just, I wonder how dangerous it can be though. If you don't, if you don't have a way to balance that out, because I can see it. You can get, so like in booty, one of the, one of our core beliefs is that you can only be as spiritual as you are grounded. So like you can get caught up in these sort of ideas and living up here, but we also are humans living on the earth right now. And how does that serve you in this moment? So making sure that you have ways to bring you back to that's important. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was what was important to me is to seeing it as an agreement that I have to make, you know, Mm -hmm. and I go, well, it's an agreement that I, I'm going to make so I can stay grounded. The agreement grounds you. I guess that was partly why that's your touching the earth moment, right? Where you go, well, but there is an I, it is just made up of a lot of things and that's okay. Mm-hmm. That's the agreement mm-hmm. that I I understand it as such. I don't get, but I can't I don't need to get caught up in my own identity too much. It's, I don't know. For me, I think it's good. I think it's healthy. It helps me um, see other beings the same way, and and not other beings as empty, but other beings as the same, as made up of things. Mm-hmm. You know, I so. like the agreement part because I hear responsibility and I hear empowerment in the sense that if it's an agreement. I have the option at any time to disregard this agreement <laughs> right. and to choose a new one. Uh-huh. Right. And I like on the, sound the of that. same yeah. side of that coin is if this is an agreement, I am responsible for living in this miserable agreement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. Right? That's yeah, a I lot can... of power and responsibility put squarely on someone's shoulders. Yeah. I like I like the uh, for me, I like to be able to dip into that and then be able to pull back. Mm-hmm. You know, like if I go for a long walk you know, and, and I'd say all the circumstances are right, you know, whatever that means. The, the weather feels good. There's sun on my skin, wind blowing. I mean, and I can just get into that space where that eye starts to dissolve a little bit. That's a wonderful feeling. It's like you feel connected to other things and to, to your life and to existence and just the whole sort of universe, I guess. You know, you're like, wow, you really start contemplating like how things arose into this point where there's conscious beings and I think that's a beautiful thing. Heart sort of open begins to open up. Um, you can stop your brain long enough. Mm-hmm. Y- you can get that. Yeah. yeah. And that's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, maintaining some residue from that when you get out in the world where you really do have to be an eye. Because Monday morning, I'm going to have to be the eye. Monday morning, I'm going to have the eye that is Orin's going to have 50 emails to deal with. And there's going to be people that want to talk to the eye that is Orin, you know? And so being able to know at least that, well, yeah, I can do this, but I'm not, this isn't all of it. Mm-hmm. That gets way back to what I said at the beginning about going into those meetings. That's, that's helps, you know, to where I can go, well, this isn't all of it. This is just a task that the eye must do. And it, I don't know, that almost creates dualism, I guess, right there, too. But it's a way for me, at least, to have moments where I know I can go back and touch that place. Mm-hmm. 
And we're off. We're off. That's great. <laughs> I was just, we're all, you know, as far we all, have, you have to have a job. You have to, you know, pay the bills, all those things. But it's like about the quality of the existent, the quality of the experience that happens while you're there. So you can be aware of that. Isn't that interesting? I'm having this thought about the eye and all these things, but I'm also here being present in this task because it's part mm-hmm. of my life, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got to take out the garbage at some point. Yeah, yeah right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what you said about the mindful meditation, that's when that comes into play. Yeah. It's just being aware throughout the day when you mm-hmm. can. I'm not shooting for, for perfection. Yeah. It, you know, and going easy on yourself. and. Sure. It's, yeah. it's really helpful me, for me to remember when I'm working with someone or myself with my mindfulness practice or meditation, I like to remember there's people, you know, who dedicate their life to this. And they right. still don't do it right all the time. Yeah. And right. they never, ever will. That yeah. is not what we're doing. Yeah. You know? That's right. That's helpful. That's funny. I was thinking about that the other day because I was kind of getting, you know, quotey fingers schooled by somebody about something that I do that they didn't agree <laughs> with in my religious quotey fingers practices. And I said, you know, and I kind of got a little, the eye got a little miffed about it. And I said, like, well, I don't want, this is, this is the type of conversation I want to have. I said, but just to challenge back, it said something similar. I said, you know, there are people who have devoted their lives to this. I started naming off a few. I said, you're just like me. You're just some guy who went to, went to a retreat, mm. you know, and maybe read some books and you're just doing the best you can out here. I'm, I'm sorry, but there's just not a lot of weight. Mm-hmm in this rebuttal yeah. i mean if you were you know a high priest from some order or you you know you're some beggar monk that's devoted your your whole life to this i might take this seriously but so i just can't you're just like me trying to find your way that out sounds here. good that sounds honest <laughs> i mean i was like i just i'm not mad at you but i'm just not even gonna have I'm, we're not gonna debate because neither you you and i are eventually going to hit a limit to what we know mm-hmm. you know that's and nice. we're gonna have to go get an expert involved if we're gonna keep going because <laughs> it's just not going anywhere but thank you for that information but thanks for yeah. telling me yeah. that you think what i'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll wait for the Dalai Lama or somebody else to tell me, and they're not going to do that because they're too busy. So, <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That does happen a lot. Do you guys ever meet anything like that out in the world where, you know, um, you do engage with people and it's like, I don't know about that. I don't know what you're doing if that's, uh, if you're hurting people or helping people. I don't know. I feel like. Uh... I've been on such a kind of personal quest to figure out how I've been hurting people, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been kind of wrapped up in that. And so, and one of the, the great things about, um, about AA in general, and I kind of wish everybody had this as like a template to live by. I just think it's the coolest thing, but it's just to like, so every situation, you know, if somebody upsets you or you have a reaction and where you react and you don't respond you react and you get and anger usually for me comes from fear it always stems from fear Mm. um it it if you look at that uh and you take it to a place where you're looking at yourself because you can't control the other person like we were saying like you take it and you're like how is this about me how is this about me like how is what they're doing affecting me where does Mm -hmm. it come from you know and you just kind of trace it back to the, to the source or at least try to find, you know, did something piss you off earlier that day or, you know, because you can, you can turn it around and you, you, you know, you really can live it. Cause I'll go home. Like if something makes me mad, I'll go home and just take it out on my husband and my kids. And I don't like that about myself, mm. you know? Um, and so right now I'm just trying to, to look at how I can change my, the footprint that I leave yeah, and not necessarily like look at other people and be like, well, you suck, you know, yeah. Just to, like, yeah. figure out how I can change the way that I interact and, and, and walk through the world. So I don't know. I'm kind of in a different, I guess, place. And as far as like the spirituality and stuff, I'm just, I'm finding all this so fascinating, but it's like, it's kind of way over my head. I'm just trying to like plant my feet on the ground here because the whole, the whole journey for me over the past year of getting sober has been like a completely different identity, you know, Mm. and this is a small town Mm. to, to, to peel off your label and be like, Oh, I'm going to put another one down. How's that for everybody? No, like nobody likes that Mm -mm. initially. It hurts. It makes people uncomfortable. Um, 
you know, and there's a lot, you're met with a lot of resistance too. Um, so I think it's very difficult when you do find your truth in the way that you want to live and, and be in the world. Like it's, it's really hard to reintegrate that person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I find often it's not going to happen. Right. And you just that really have to let go. Yeah. It's, well, and, and when he's asking, do I meet resistance with, not really because I put a lot of priority into surrounding myself with people who have the there same go. values. Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Totally. So to peel off my label, and I, I say this because I've been there too, to peel mm-hmm. off my label and then try to put that new person in with those old people. It mm, doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I get that too. I get that too. I, I run the risk of uh, not having a lot of people to be quite honest right. with you because of that. Because... Right. I, you know, you end up in a situation where, for me anyway, my, my situation is like, well, then I don't really have a group of people to practice with. Well, and here's you know? something interesting. I imagine that is lonely at the top of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> there are days where it's, uh, yeah, sometimes. There aren't a lot of people at the top of a mountain. Mm-hmm. It's the top of a mountain. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's funny that you said that. One time in meditation, something I wrote down was, it was this, it was... Go to the mountain, drink from the fountain, come down, come back down. down to the See, wilderness. See, that's nice. <laughs> and so, you know, the going to the wilderness part is the part that I'm trying to live in now. Because, mm. I mean, you can go be by yourself on the top of the mountain. But, I mean, if you're not if you're not going back to the fish market, you know, and it, with everybody else, then what's, what's the value in it? Because that's where, that's where life happens. I think, too, just having an understanding that everyone acts from their own history and culture and beliefs and things that shape them and that any action someone's doing is not necessarily about you. It's about yeah. them. And so staying grounded in your place and having compassion for them for where they are and what's going on with them right. and can help you not be triggered as much. Mm-hmm. By yeah, it. right. Totally. That's exactly right. I mean a lot of times that's kind of where I end up is like, we don't have to have this conversation. I mean, we don't not, not, you know, we can just be nice to each other and just keep it there and just Mm -hmm. be generally kind. But this, the world has changed a little bit. I mean, we, we do live in an interesting age where there's a lot of polarized viewpoints. There's a lot of, um, aggression and everybody has an opportunity to sort of put anybody on blast too. So it's, it's a different kind of world in that regard. I don't know. I do find it interesting what you're talking about. I always like your perspective because it's very down on the ground. We're talking about like very low to the ground. Touching. Yeah. Well, what I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean though. Like yeah. it's like you're. I like what you said. You're like, man. I'm just like trying to just do this. You know. I mean, all this other stuff. I well, can't even. Just to, and and also, I find it fascinating. To like listen to you talk about yoga and you talk about yoga teaching yoga for seven years i'm just now figuring out what it's about and i'm not kidding okay like i've been teaching it to people who some people like my classes which is shocking to me um but i'm having like i'm a student now i'm having to go back because all that time i was using or doing whatever trying to numb and just you know and i I taught like hungover and blah, blah 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 it's terrible but um I, I think yoga is amazing. And I'm like, oh, I get it now after seven years. I get why people like it. How mm-hmm. fun. You That's know, so you really cool. like, you breathe and you actually listen to the sensations in your body. I've never done that in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I just think it's, I can't wait to come take one of your classes, by the way. I love to have you. And booty's yeah. so fun because, you know, we do with the high energy. So you're up energetically and then we're on the ground, like grounding, and then we're moving through breath work and yoga poses. And so you get the energetic movement and the sitting and the postures and being present in your body. And so it's, uh, for me, like the perfect. It's well blend. rounded. It it's sounds well like rounded, a really yeah. good blend. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Yeah. I think it's Paul's turn. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I have no idea what's coming. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like the duality of like I love I've said this before on here, I love people, but I'm afraid of people. Mm-hmm. And I just think we maybe are afraid of what's gonna happen if we show a soft, tender spot because then the rib cage is off and the it's out there. It's like out there to be hurt. <laughs> You know? yeah. Oh yeah. I felt that coming, coming here. Really my concern with coming here and doing this isn't you and I, Yeah. but the vulnerability of I'm in a podcast. Yeah. People are going to listen to this. And here's mm-hmm. the beauty of being in a relationship of being in counseling and doing some kind of inner work with someone. I extend myself to you 
Now you have the ability to chop my hand off. Yeah. And that's vulnerability. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. So that's that's the concern. I think always. And at any new any relationship, it's growing and there's always a new vulnerability coming around the corner. <laughs> yeah. It's just can I trust you? Yeah. With that, you know. Yeah. Not to hurt me too bad. Yeah. Just Wow, listen to that guy. Look at that guy. He's got something wow. to say. That jumped out at me. You said a lot of good things, but yeah, that I got jumped out at Just, me. I got a little emotional. Oh, yeah. Man. yeah, that jumped out at me because the vulnerability part really, you know, that's I, I find a lot of value in being vulnerable, but I'm afraid to be vulnerable because, you know, sting, mm. cut, stab, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes courage. Courage. And isn't it weird how great it feels to get vulnerable with someone Mm -hmm. after it's done? Isn't it weird (laughs) that at first your brain is like, do not do this ever again. Maybe it's not everyone's brain, but my brain Mm -hmm. does that. Don't go there. Don't say that thing. Mm -hmm. But when I decide to say it and I start saying it to you, I'm already feeling great. You know, I'm listening to that guy talk. I'm like, man, he's feeling good right there. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. We were having a moment that maybe their listeners don't even get, but like, you and I were having a moment yeah. there. And that feels good. So yeah. it takes practice to learn how good that feels. Because mm-hmm. at first... To trust it. To trust, to trust it. To trust that it's yeah. going to feel good. Because usually, it's like I, I did this once before long ago and I made a promise to myself back then that I would never allow myself to get hurt like that ever yes. again. Yes, I think well, I would relate and to that. That keeps us locked up. And that keeps our connection from from happening yeah Yeah. i wonder you know that this is really more related to your each of your experiences is coming on here individually did each of you kind of feel that way at first like coming in here for the show when you because i've never met (laughs) completely for me yeah it was really nerve-wracking vulnerable like i don't know what what's this all about like yeah luckily i've had some practice at putting myself in you know some (laughs) some positions um and so i've learned to just go with that fear and let it just be whatever it's going to be and it works out fine but it's it's still there even i don't know that it will ever go away there's always going to be a fear with being vulnerable but like what you said with practice i think the more you do it and the more you you allow yourself to be there um the better it feels and the more likely you are to approach it again and to know that good things come from it yeah did you have that experience coming here yeah i mean i um actually listening back to it because i was i remember texting all my friends and being like i'm so nervous i'm gonna be on this podcast and then i came on i was like oh i think that went really well and then i listened back and i was like and now i know that you don't like when people say um and and oh. <laughs> like, how many times have i said okay, um during now this conversation I know. <laughs> I thought that too. Uh, that's funny i just like <laughs> you have a right you have the right to say um and and as you many can say it i deal with it you're yeah. still a good you know person. what's crazy i actually oh, had that speech God. teacher her episode comes out next week oh, yeah cool. she was on this show oh, that's yeah great. that's right <sighs> oh she she is such she was one of those teachers who Oh, I say mentor really because she just like I, I said she's a hinge in my life because like so much comes out of that class even us at this table comes out of that speech class I mean it's still man I told her I was like it's weird you sitting across from me now it's a dream come true because yeah I mean she was just that kind of teacher you mm-hmm. know it was speech class but it was so much more than that mm-hmm. I, I mean I left with tools that I still use today but yeah, I mean, it's y'all aren't different. I guess I will say that everybody who's come on this show has had has said the same thing. I, one guy, um, it was interesting because the way we do the interviews, we just kind of get in it. We don't go, okay, now we're starting, and then mm-hmm. the anxiety builds. I was like, man, I'm I'm anxious too and nervous too, so I don't like that. I'd rather just roll into it. And he said, man, he said I was so nervous, and I kept waiting for the podcast to start, and I was drinking my coffee, and I was like. <laughs> Hang on a second. We've been talking for like 30 minutes. Is this, are we, are we on? And I was like, yeah. He goes, oh, so that's what this is. We're just talking. I was like, yeah. He goes, oh, okay. I don't know what I was saying. <laughs> he said, I had all this like idea in my head 
that was just building up into this ball of nerves. And then when I realized, oh, that's all we're doing. We're just having a cup of coffee. Well, I think the hard thing is that, you know, it's like there's not a canned response. You know, like you don't you don't have answers to all the questions. Yeah. And if you're like me, you don't necessarily always trust what's going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this like, oh, I'm going to sound like an idiot right. or like, you know, uh, just like a jerk. Um, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. And so I, I, mean, do. I don't want people to hate me. You know, I like, feel like that every episode. I'll just so y'all know, yeah. every single time I sit down here to talk, I mean, I felt like that with you guys coming in today. I thought, you know, nobody can ever say anything dumber than I'm going to say because I don't know things. I mean, I know what I know and I don't know what I don't know. And I can't pretend to know things that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to do that with this show is go, I really just don't know. Mm. I can talk about the uh, something that I think is relevant but I can't talk outside of what I know. I mean, I'm not going to sit, if I sit here and pretend to be mm -hmm. that, I, I'm faking that. I don't want that for people. For me, it's curiosity more than anything that drives it. As I really am curious about things about people. Mm -hmm. you know? But I think you're doing such a beautiful thing. I mean, you're you're bringing people together. You're You're putting people on the show. And we come here, like, we have to be vulnerable to a certain extent. And that gives other people, like, permission in their lives to be vulnerable, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's in that. Like you said, y'all had that connection. That's the good stuff, you know? Like, that's the stuff, connecting with people, giving them, saying it's okay to, like, share your truth because it's mine, too. Like, we're more alike than you think. I think that's just what we're missing, mm -hmm. you know? I think that's such a Yeah, I think you're thing. right. I think that is something the world is, is uh, hungry for, perhaps, you know? And that may end at some point and change forms but uh i think right now definitely we need that i mean some place that's safe you know people want to feel safe i really believe that too but they want to feel safe they want to feel like they're not alone they don't want to feel like they're out on an island you know or floating in outer space and isolated so many people i i, I that i encounter are carrying everything around just inside their own chamber with them it's mm -hmm. just echoing and echoing and they feel but so then their facebook pictures look so perfect oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah mm. i want to see like close-ups and like pimples and stuff yeah <laughs> i want to see like the bumpy. real yeah yeah there's this book that i i got at a thrift store back in the 90s uh by shogim Trungpa called the mandala principle and i don't remember everything because he is a he was a heavy thinker but there was this one thing that he said that just it rung out from the whole book and i've kept it in my mind ever since you know the mandalas how they, they clean the space there's a whole ritual with it and it takes so long to build and it's this big sacred thing and he said this and i went god so shocking but i get what he's saying he was like we need to learn to clean the floor where we're going to build the mandala with shit and piss and i was like wow dude i stopped right there and just thought about that for days i didn't even read that book for days i was like man he is saying something really powerful right there that we have to be able to see the sacred in things that are not sacred at some point or we're never going to find balance hmm. you know if we're always chasing after a diamond or a jewel or some pristine state a the perfect more, life. Yeah, a perfect life, you know. And and he wasn't trying to be foul when he said it. I mean, the, the tone with what you said, it was like, look, I just need you. He said it very plainly in the book. And I was like, yeah, I, I do understand what he's, he called it the razor's edge. Hmm. You know, to, to live, this is, this is the point, to, this is the point right here. This is the slice, you know, right on the edge of great discovery is when you can clean the sacred space with shit and piss god it's gonna sound terrible coming across like that but i mean it, it's just what it said and uh anyway i mean still it's a good book i mean if anybody's interested in that kind of he's thing a, he's a heavy heavy read I've, I've got one of his books too and i kind of yeah i kind of put it down i don't know if i ever picked it back up <laughs> you know he's an interesting figure yeah. come get off on a different tangent but i mean he's again he's a, a good example of okay human being here you've got this teacher comes out of tibet and creates his own sort of, I guess, new lineage of Tibetan Buddhism with the Shambhala Institute. But now you've got all these stories coming out about him being a womanizer and a drug addict. And, you know, and, and he uh, just all kinds of stories. And so you go, OK, so how do I feel? I've got this giant library with all these 
Shogyam Trungpa <laughs> books that I've read that I've got underlined and that I committed to memory. I mean, I just shared a, a thing that stuck with me. And now there's all these stories. So how do I feel about those teachings? I, I just think that's an interesting meditation into itself. Do I separate the teachings from these things? Yeah. You know, or are his teachings still valid now that you find out that he was doing these things i think that's interesting it's a good question i mean because that well, happens a same lot Same with like bikram yoga or whatever yeah. right mm-hmm. same with ryan adams Ryan Adams. Uh, yeah no you're right what I mean, are you gonna a, do you know it's a tough question yeah i don't think you can separate i think you can set well you can separate the pieces of them and say like he was this but he also had these brilliant things and teachings that he shared and that doesn't negate all the good that he did because he also had these things and i think if you can separate that i think in people in general and say like this person did this thing to me in this area and i'm not going to trust them in this area but that doesn't mean that they're bad in right. all domains yeah. just maybe in this one right right, right. it's hard I, 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 I hear what you're saying and i kind of believe it mm-hmm. and i want it to be true for me <laughs> yeah but when it's i a- try to listen to ryan adams oh you can't anymore it just doesn't <laughs> work <laughs> anymore interesting i know that's why uh, i brought I'm it up so maybe. honest i want that to be true and mm-hmm. i've tried and it, right now it doesn't seem to work for me oh yeah it's a hard it's hard i don't think it's easy yeah. I, I mean, i've had some experiences um with that that i'm still trying to work through with, with different people in my life but i also don't want to take away sort of the brilliance that they they've mm-hmm. given to me just mm-hmm. because of one belief that they may have mm-hmm. um so i think it's a hard balance to find and to each person it's their own and yeah and how you you're okay with going about well, it. i think even like the catholic church is really going through that right now yeah. because people are going how can you claim a moral authority of anything how can you take the mor- claim any kind of moral authority, considering yeah. the extent of the sex sexual abuse cover up that's been going on for you so long? And so, I, and I get the question. And there are people that go, "Doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a hard boiled whatever." And then there's other people going, "I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to go now. I'm going. I'm not so sure." Of that. Mm. So yeah, I don't know. Just because it's difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I struggle with that, even with with Trungpa. I mean, I do because I had two, I have two books that I had bought that I didn't read, and they're in my like stack of to read books. And I I do find myself uh, when I get to one particular book, it's uh, oh I can't remember. It's something like work, sex, and something else is the title. That particular book, I'm just like I, get, I read the title, work, sex. Man, I don't you know if I can read one. this. I don't know if I can read this without thinking. Mm about what was going on with the man at the time it's just weird what's yeah. that um y'all help me the the netflix documentary with that with osho osho yeah oh uh, yeah what's what's the name of i don't it? know what y'all are talking about the i forget the name of it so osho is like an indian guru, guru. Type, is it called it's called yeah. <coughs> um, oh, i haven't seen that and he came to the states and i want to say oregon somewhere in the midwest they they had this whole um what would you call it? Uh, commune. Or commune. Yeah. That they created and people flocked there and did, lived by his teachings. And it was this, I mean, it seems that the first episode you're like, this is kind of, I can get into this. I like it. But um, by the end, they get really violent and some things happen. And um, yeah. so they're saying that he was more of a cult, but he's got a whole bunch of books and like, and I have and, the books mm-hmm. and there's and people I have them underlined. I'm just like, what is happening here? Like, yeah. I know people who are Osho practitioners now and, um, you know, it's hard. They they separate um, sort of the teachings that he did and the person he was from what happened in that space. Um, His so books again, are very, they're written, like the tone is, do you have, a, mm-hmm. do you know what I'm talking about? They're I don't very either. aggressive. I've never read his book. Like so. I remember being like, whoa, dude, you know, calm down a little bit. But then you watch <laughs> the documentary and you're like, oh. Interesting. So I don't know. I agree. Some of the stuff you got to say was good, but I just can't. Like I can't do. It's it. hard. Yeah. Yeah, that is hard, and I can see you with Ryan Adams. I know what you're uh-huh. saying because I mean I like you and I. It's funny because you sent me a Ryan Adams song Did after I? After, <laughs> after our episode. Oh, wow. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, because what we was were, it? it was um. Well, I was we were talking about a haunted house, like having oh, a house. Oh my gosh, I love that song. Yeah, and you sent me that song. I was like, oh, dude, you said God. this song reminds me of what we talked about, and I was like, wow, it does. It sounds like such what we a talk. beautiful song. It comes what out of it. I know. Yeah. 
Loved past tense. Yeah. Loved. Yeah, no, that's Someone hard. needs to remake it. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe you got something there. <laughs> yeah, that is that is difficult, though. I, I get it. I mean, it talk, and then again, you get into that. We're kind of being vulnerable right now because we're talking about all these teachers and teachings that we all have our, our, our yeah. songs that have affected our lives and they're inside our hearts and they're they kind of somewhere they're driving us they're making our eye that affects the world somewhere out there they're in our history hmm. and then you find out oh it can't, it's coming out of like this sort of tainted well you know of it's uh, weird just, if we're going to talk about art that's a different conversation mm. <laughs> Does good art come out of a well that isn't tainted? Mm, that's good. That's I don't good think point. so. I don't think so. I don't think so. No. no. I think you have to have pain. I don't think you need to be in pain currently because I think that's why a lot of artists stay in the, you know, in their addiction is because they're like, well, if I don't have, you know, the devil oh, sitting yeah. next to me, then I have nothing. And that's what I felt for a long really? time, forever. Yeah. And it's been hard to actually get back into creative kind of spheres because I'm like, well, I kind of connect that to when I was taking a lot of Adderall mm. or I kind of connect that to when oh, I yeah. was like music was when I was drinking all the time. And, um, and so it's really, you know, I, I think that's why a lot of artists stay stuck in their addiction. But then, um, mm. there's also time culturally in America, there's kind yes. of like romanticized substances mm -hmm. and self-destruction goes with the songwriter. Kind yeah. Of. Oh, yeah. Even, even authors, you know, like yeah. Ernest Hemingway and oh, I yeah. mean, whoever yeah. else, like the, everybody's just, you know, they drink all day and they, no, 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 I mean, and Stephen King, like you read some of his books and it's just like, man, um, so I think, you know, trying to like get get away from that and and realize that like you don't you don't have to be that, you know, but I do think you have to have been through mm you know, the darkness and walked out of it to tell the tale. I do think that's important. But like you said, suffering is mandatory or no pain is mandatory. Suffering is optional or whatever. Like pain is going to happen. Mm. So um, whether or not you ask for it, you know, it's, it's going to be there. It's interesting. And I'm happy. I know it. this episode's fishing for goodies. Fishbowl sponsor is Brimstone Museum and Henning Cultural Center in Sulphur, Louisiana. I don't know what you look for when you travel, but one of the things I look for when I'm putting together my itinerary is a unique museum or gallery in the city I'm traveling to. I do this almost every time I go to a new city, but if I'm being honest, I'm guilty of not always doing that very thing right here at home in Sulphur, Louisiana. That's really a shame because we have one of the most interesting, historically relevant, and culturally rich corners in any city in the country about two minutes from where I'm sitting right now. I'm talking about the Brimstone Museum and Henning Cultural Center. Have you ever really thought about why our city is named Sulphur? They've got a permanent exhibit on the history of the sulphur industry that answers that simple question and more. You really get a full scope of just how important the sulphur mining industry was to the development of Southwest Louisiana and the impact it had on the rest of the world. Yes, the rest of the world. On the same property, right next door to the museum, is the Henning Cultural Center, presenting some of the most interesting, modern, and culturally relevant local art shows I've ever seen. My dear friend Tom Trahan and the Brimstone Historical Society have really worked hard to give us this treasure, and it's a multifaceted jewel that I plan to take advantage of more often. You don't have to wonder what their hours are, or how to get there, or what shows are coming up. Just go to brimstonemuseum.org, like I did, and subscribe to their mailing list list right there on the home page. That's brimstonemuseum.org. Tom will make sure you start getting the announcements for each and every new show at the gallery. But you don't have to wait for the mail to arrive to enjoy this historical local treasure. You don't have to be guilty, like me, of overlooking a local wonder that conveniently sits next to the Grove, one of the most beautiful walking parks in southwest Louisiana. Drop in and say hi to Tom for me. Tour the museum and center, and make sure to tell Tom that you heard about Brimstone Museum on Find the Good News. Now, let's take that dive in the fishbowl. This has been a fun conversation. We're going to move into the fishbowl <laughs> section of the show. This, uh, let me be honest. On the era of the podcast, this is the one that gives me the most anxiety. The fishbowl. Yeah, yeah Because fish you just bowl. don't know what's coming. Because yeah, this isn't really. coming from me. It's coming from wherever. Yeah. I can confirm he's sweating now. I can <laughs> <laughs> Let the record reflect. <laughs> Not did y'all all feel that way about the fishbowl? Yeah. I did. Yeah, it's just very unnerving. But let's do it. You know what's crazy? 
<laughs> Let's dive it's, in. It's everybody's favorite part of the show. Cool. I, didn't, I did not know that, but I get tons of feedback on that fishbowl part. Oh, my gosh. Because we're all so, like, you know, clenching our butt cheeks together. Yeah. Well, the, the one question that came well, out of there, like, really got me was um, Irvin Luke's episode. I don't know if y'all have listened to it, but he drew this question. It said, what's the... What's the most unfair thing about socialism? And we were both like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think I heard that one. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> we, I like candy. <laughs> <laughs> he and I both said, Okay, we're going to say neither of us are qualified to have this conversation. So, to Paul, will you grab the fishbowl? It's right oh, over there oh, behind shit. you. And we're going to let's go, go right around the table. Rosie, you go first. I have to pick. Why am I going first? And look, there's something time. new in there. Let me let me warn you. There's some. There's An some, actual fish. There are cards. I don't know. With you were here, it was just paper slips, but now there's cards in there. Oh, wow. The, some of the cards are what ifs, like not what ifs. Uh, would you rather's? Oh okay. Uh, the other ones are writing prompts, and then the little slips of paper are just the questions fans submit. Writing it's, uh, prompts. Writing prompts. We need yeah. a little mini meditation session to get grounded. Before <laughs> <laughs> Feel the card. Oh, you did. A, would you rather? Feel the card in your hand. Feel your <laughs> sensation. Good. Good. Oh, that's okay, funny. <laughs> what is this? So would you? Uh, would you rather? <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh my lord. Okay. Would you rather change the past or see into the future? Oh wow. Huh. <coughs> Somebody else drew that one. <coughs> Excuse me. You want me to put it back? I can no, it no, yeah. no, no, no. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I wouldn't want to change the past. Oh, um, wow. Because I don't think I would be where I am right now in my life, which is the happiest I've ever been, despite you know being depressed over the last couple of days. Um, <laughs> but I think Elizabeth's going to help me with that. <laughs> um, because every single thing stacked up so that I could kind of climb the stairway to where I am exactly right now. I don't think I could have gone through any less pain. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it all had to happen exactly as it did. So, I definitely wouldn't change the past. I would... I wouldn't mind seeing into the future. Um, just so I could, you know, have a little better idea of what decisions I'm supposed to make now. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's just like a shot in the dark. You have to make a decision has to be made always. Well, what, let me ask you this, though. You said uh, you wouldn't the past the pains, all the things that have made you who you are. Yeah, what if you so look fun. in the future and what you see is there's a great pain right in front of you? That comes in the future. A greater okay. pain than well, possible. Well, it doesn't say. It doesn't say there's doesn't a great say, pain. You no, know, but it doesn't <laughs> say that I can stay in the present. Would you rather change well, the past or see into the future? If in this, if right now, though, sitting right here, if all of a sudden you get a vision of the future, 10 years from now, and you see a great pain in your life, does that affect do you do something to avoid it? Do you shift what you're doing today? You go, okay, I'm going to avoid this. Or because you share, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this because you said all that pain that happened to me made me who I am. But now you've got the awareness that one's coming. Is that one just as, in the future pain just as valuable as the past pain? Yes. So I you don't so. change it. Mm-mm. It's interesting. What I don't you? think so. Maybe make it a little bit less. Now I have a funny story. So when I was 25, um, speaking of seeing your future, uh, we went on a trip to the Grand Canyon, and. Um, the the little hippie lady that was guiding our uh, our rafting trip decided one night like we'd all have had a couple beards obviously and she was like oh I can read palms and so we all lined up and uh, everyone was like oh long life oh love oh this is oh you have such a nice future and I was like oh so she gets to me and she was like oh I was Man. like what she she was, said there's a break in your fate line. Like, right in the middle. And I looked down and I was like, shit. (laughs) She's right. (laughs) And there was. And, like, there was all this pain ahead of me. And I could, you know, I went and had several more beers to just try to forget that. But there wasn't anything I could do. Like, I had to walk through it. You know what I mean? So, I just don't think there's anything, even if you know that. Like, I, I definitely believed her. Well, hey, that's the title of your episode of the show. What? The Undone Fate. Oh. I named oh, it that yeah. off of your break line. Because oh. I said you kind of undid that, though. You've oh, changed it. That's See? So cool. You changed your timeline. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that was how I saw everything. Everything you talked about in that episode, I thought, well, you've you've kind of got that peak into the future and you've redialed it. You've fixed that break. 
potentially. You kind of rerouted. Did. Yeah. 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 You undid yeah. it. Yeah. I'm going to get a tattoo that connects those two together at some point. Yeah. A little break. Have, um, what about you guys? Are y'all, would y'all do that? See in the future or the past? I don't know that I would want to. Uh, I feel like I'd want to live in the present. I think that the experience, like, life's thrown me some. That's not on here. I know, but I'll, I'll I'm make joking. my own thing. Can, yeah, I <laughs> <do> that. Um, <laughs> I kind of like the adventure of life. You know, I've gone through lots of things that have not been pleasant and things that mm. have. And I like sort of the journey of experiencing those, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know that future's written in stone. You know, I think every from every moment we make choices that lead us here and this choice leads us there. And so to see into the future, I don't know how I maybe it can give you like a map of, you know, maybe I would do this or, or not do that. But mm. I, I don't know. I just try to live in the present more. Yeah. That's what I, You'd, you'd want to not have the... You don't want to look at either the past nor the... Yeah. Because you already can kind of look in... Well, you can't travel to the past, I guess, but you can look in the past to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that... What do y'all think about that? Like, looking in the past. Do you think we look into the past accurately within ourselves? I think not. I agree with that. I think we... I think I, I think try, not. but I don't know that... I, I always feel like I... Somehow, I'm skewing the view of it. Marie. Well, let's say we don't remember experiences. We remember our emotions of the experience. So that's uh, already going to be skewed uh, from what the actual yeah, facts that's, were. that makes sense. You can add magic to things mm-hmm. where it might have just been nothing. You know, I know I do that. I mean, I kind of like it because it mm-hmm. helps me make sacred memories or make things sacred well just like even pain memories can be made sacred because you've attached an emotion to them and that's like a node now it's very powerful there's like this pulsing coming off of it and it's just sort of affecting you still but if you don't add magic to it or you don't attach emotions to it i mean maybe you can see it more plainly more as it was and versus how you i don't know if that's possible though to not Mm. i mean we're human we're humans. We live in emotion. You can't not attach it, but just to know that that that's your emotion and that's your memory through your emotion, and that maybe your memory of that same event is yeah. slightly different because yeah. your emotion may have been different yeah. may attached to it. Yeah, it makes sense. What about you? So you want me to answer this question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it says, "Would you rather?" <laughs> rather. Would you rather <laughs> change the past or see into the future? Um, I would change the past. Ah, okay. In a heartbeat. Number one, because really? the card says change the past or see into the future. Uh, that's the option. It's mm-hmm. not just seeing the past. You got You can either change it or just look in the future. Right. Okay. Um, I would change. I would change many things about the past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what else you'd like to know about that. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Let's be vulnerable. Let's yeah. uh, give us two answers to this, Paul. Well, give oh us God. the. Let's start with the safe for TV. Ver- the safe for TV thing you'd change in the past, and then if you feel more comfortable, what's something like maybe that makes you vulnerable saying that you would change in the past? So you want two things that I would change in the past: one that is safe and easy, and one that is more vulnerable. Yeah. You are a therapist, aren't you? Repeating yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah, I just want to be clear. Yeah. Um, the easy made-for-TV answer would be about the past. Jeez, um, is there one? Um, I guess I, if I could change the past, I would. it's hard to answer this question because I want to change myself. Mm. And change the past a little bit sounds like back to the future and just sort of manipulating a situation but i would want my past self to do a better job with his education as an undergraduate student when i was an undergraduate student at lsu i had no appreciation or regard for what i had access to and i was like this ungrateful just really angry Dude, who was surrounded by an incredible university that could have just done anything at all. But my story, like you were saying, was you're not smart enough to be here. You don't want to be here. Why are you here? Just rebel and do do things mm-hmm. that uh, are not helpful. So I, w- I would want to change that. And it's like I, when I look back in that past, I can see glimpses of a person who would have loved to study psychology or philosophy, 
but he was too caught up in his own story to get that and he just couldn't see just couldn't see it i can see it now but i could not see it then so that's one very safe for tv thing that i would like to change you want something more juicy now if if you feel com- if you feel comfortable <laughs> i mean it's you know i know that's I, i'm comfortable with being uncomfortable it's just that my brain is going in so many directions i'm not sure which way to go gotcha do that one can anyone be specific <laughs> Um, how about just something? Is there something from your childhood? Like I'm talking pre, like preteen, that I would want to change in the yeah. past. Yeah. Hmm. One thing I would want to change in the past. Hmm. Now that's going way back. It's so broad that I'm struggling with it. Can anybody be more specific? Hmm. How about? And this may be a safe way to frame it. Something from pre- preteen age that has to do with friendships hmm. and relationships, like personal relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, here's something that is vulnerable. My relationship with my dad has been one that has been disconnected from a very young age. Okay. And it's only recently as an older person that we've connected. And so if I could change the past, I would change that damage and connection. And... And that means I would go back and change that person again mm. and give him the ability to do it. Yeah. So that is what I would change. And if, if I could get that young person free of the anger and the resentment because of his damaged connection with his father, that person would have been able to accomplish many more things than I'm accomplishing now because I've started later. Mm. Because that connection was healed later. Mm. So that's that's absolutely something I would change. And and because he would be so much more happy back then as a 17-year-old if he could have had that right then. Yeah. You know, but that's a lot to thrust upon a teenager. It is. Um, but that's what I would change if I could go back and do it. It's very interesting. And we may have talked about this on your episode, but your answer... I've not Not because of that question, but even at a young age... I've always had this fantasy about going back and doing something Mm. like that. And it's very similar to what you just said. I have one thing, and it would be related to my father. And it's actually like I I had this idea, like I would daydream about it. Even as an adult, for many years, I was like, if I could go back and do one thing, just pick it for me, Mm -hmm. that's what I would do. I was like, I had this whole idea. I would get a composition notebook, and I would tell my younger self as a teenager when I was old enough to comprehend what I was reading Uh I would give this notebook to them and let them know who my father really was so that younger person could see him with compassion like okay you need to see why he is who he is because once you understand these things that I now know at 45 you will have you will work You yeah. have a better relationship with him, and it will make y'all's relationship better. It's the same thing. I mean, I want that so bad. If I could go back, that's what I would do. And and the reason that I have this answer is because I've gone back and done it. This is one of the things you can do in therapy. Mm. <laughs> that maybe we all have a 17-year-old inside of us who needs some stuff. Yeah. And that's one of the things yours needs. Well, it's one of the things mine needed, too. And I went back and did that. And there are wounds to be healed that can be healed. Yeah. As an older person. But if I could go back and change the past, it would be right then. Yeah. That'd be nice. Honest. That's a big piece I was just going to say of education for living training is going through, you know, your primary relationships with your mother and your father and sort of having conversations with them just on personally on mm-hmm. without actually having the conversation with them and sort of seeing them where they were mm-hmm. at that time and trying to see them as a person, you know doing the best that they could with what they had at the time. And yes, as an adult, you right. can look back and see that. But if you can do that early, you know, like right. 20 versus 36 and yeah. get, you know. I always had this fantasy that like, I, it's so silly how I daydreamed about it. I was like, it was back, very back to the future style. Like, and that's my favorite movies are sitting behind me. You know, it's like, I always thought, man, I even remember watching Back to the Future. And I think I watched that movie 250 times as a kid. And I was like, wow, what would that be like? Like, he can actually go back and like, I don't know, just fascinated Mm -hmm. me. I got latched on that. And I was like, man, what would I do? And I just had this whole like scheme in my mind, like how I would do it, where I'd put it. What would the younger version of me think? How would that change who I become? All that stuff. I would just... It was very fascinating. It wasn't an obsession. It was just 
an interesting mm-hmm. thought experiment, like I guess to call it. Mm-hmm. So, cool. yeah, I get it. But I mean, if you uh, can do that, if you could do that, it's a, a noble it cause a, at least. It could be a powerful tool mm-hmm. and what's available to you in life moving forward. Yeah. Now it's your turn to draw. Okay, my time has come to draw <clears throat> from the fishbowl. <laughs> You can't work in the bowl. <laughs> I looked in the bowl. Okay. I've got I've I've selected the item from the fishbowl. <laughs> For the viewers and listeners at home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, mine is lighthearted. Describe yourself in terms of food. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yay. That's a nice palate cleanser. (laughs) Thank you, listener, for this lighthearted question. (laughs) And now I'm drawing a blank. That's actually kind of a tough question. question. (laughs) So what you're asking me to do is to describe myself in terms of food. (laughs) Okay, um, I'm thinking really hard. That's what's happening right now. I'm thinking so hard. And most of what I'm thinking about is how to not sound like a complete idiot. That's a hard question, though. I mean, like, when my it's... inner critic comes online, it says, make sure you don't sound like an idiot. And it's in full force. So this question has really served its purpose. You can put it back in the fish. <laughs> Did I answer it yet? <laughs> Describe yourself in terms of food. Let me first start by saying what it is that I love to eat most of all. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) People want to know. This is funny. Here's a funny story. I love Domino's pizza. Really? Pizza's my favorite food. (laughs) Yes. Is it really? Is it? And there was a time when I was, I had a friend at my house and I said, oh my God, this pizza is so good. I don't think if you could take me to like the deepest regions of Italy, could you give me a better pizza in my whole life? <laughs> over, over a domino, man, domino's, domino's pizza. My friend looks at me, Taylor Lee, and says, that's the most white trash thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> wow, man. Domino's should listen to this. Yeah. What a testimonial. <laughs> Um, so if I were to describe myself in terms of food it might be uh, round warm and and simply delicious stuffed crust no there's no stuffed crust what you see is what you get on the surface there's no hidden cheese in here anywhere it's just you know fulfilling crust I get that solid within yeah um there would be no. there would be um, pepperoni on top and beef. Mm. <laughs> what Solid. else can I say about myself in terms of food? I mean, you ask and I will come to your door, and it will be delicious. Ooh. Oh, yeah, Man, I like that. Not good for you, I guess. The pizza is not good for in you. So I, I'm trying to make food it groups. Good. Yeah, yeah. And pizza's broad. I mean, there's like tomatoes, you know, there's vegetable, there's cauliflower crust. I'm trying pizza. to make sense of the not so good for you part. Um, definitely make you feel good. Oh yeah, uh. right away. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pizza. I don't know. I, you know, I'm really struggling with this question and uh, this situation. That is a tough one. <laughs> you did great. I you think did. so, too. That was awesome. Hey, it's not going to be any easier, I don't think, for any of us. So. Okay. Oh, th- does that mean you're all going to Oh, yeah, question? that's right. Everybody. Oh, Elizabeth, wonderful. Well, now, you like pizza. Well, so. I was going to go with pizza because I was like, that's my favorite food. Only because, but I was like, I can, I can be plain, and you can layer it plain. But I can also put on all kinds of toppings and make it fancy and change things up. And um, oh. I'm, there's lots of layers, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that is a really good way to look at pizza. Would you have the stuffed crust? I wouldn't have the stuffed crust. I don't like stuffed crust. Yeah. What's your favorite pizza? Like, hmm. how do you like it? If you're going, oh, one pizza, this is the one. Just pepperoni. Like, just that's my... cheese and pepperoni. But then I also like, you know, jalapenos and pineapple and, like, really? bacon, all the all the good stuff. Where from? Like, what's your pizza place? Well, so, I have to eat grain-free and uh, gluten-free, so Mellow Mushroom, luckily, does right a, a yeah. vegan no, no, cheese. No, no, and so, I get their Pacific Rim pizza. Um, no, or I, may, I, have, I make my own, uh, like, pizza crust. It's not as delicious, but uh, it, it works. And uh, yeah. I'll have it, like... 
uh, I just went to Europe and I ate pizza everywhere I could go. Was it as good as Domino's Pizza? I'm going to say the the thin crust Domino's, they have one that's uh, jalapenos and pineapple, the same thing. And when I would eat it, that was my favorite. But Wow. It is interesting when you watch documentaries about pizza. I know I've seen something on Netflix. uh, Some chef goes around. There was a whole pizza episode. And it was pretty fascinating, like the pizza snobs that are out there. They're saying, oh, that's not pizza. There's like sushi pizza. I mean, pizza Mm -hmm. has a lot of... I guess different dimensions to it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting. It's so good. I was in Scottsdale, and there's a place that they import all the ingredients from Italy. Um, and so I was like, I don't. Ca- I'm eating it all, and it was the best. I was like, I don't care how bad this makes me feel. That first bite, I was like, I'm in heaven. This wow. is delicious. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Sounds great. So you would choose. Pe- y'all both would choose pizza. Yeah. Pizza, a bottle of wine, and a chocolate truffle is like perfect it's night not, for me. Yeah. So. It, okay. So it, the question says, describe yourself in terms of food. Mm. So I mean, that's pr- yeah terms like describe yourself in terms of food it's not necessarily what is my favorite food which is what i end up doing but how would you describe yourself in terms of food Mm. i think you did that you said delicious comes to the door maybe good you know not stuffed crust because you're authentic Uh uh-huh yeah Yeah, i made a nice metaphor you're welcome for that question what you're welcome for that thank you rosie you have to answer that question too i know the answer oh you do are you pizza too I cannot. Not. I'm a frozen pizza. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Takes me a while to thaw. Uh huh. Um, nice. And I'm usually bubbly at the top, like just about to explode, mm. which is kind of how I live. But my what's life. underneath? Like lava hot sauce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Okay, you know those. Um, there's like little bags of jalapenos that are crunchy. They're yeah, like breaded yeah. jalapenos like that I put on everything. Mm-hmm. That's what I put on my pizza. It can be any pizza. That actually sounds pretty good. And, but I put that on top so it's crunchy and spicy. Interesting. Yeah, crunchy. The fact that you're crunchy and spicy. Crunchy <laughs> bubbly and on spicy. top. <laughs> yeah. I had a while. Nice. Like, <laughs> what the, what, now, what are the odds for real that you're going to draw that question and then all three of you are actually going to say pizza is your favorite? I don't know. Food. Every Friday. I don't know the odds. Yeah, that's wild. Can't I think you're still it. troubled. Is pizza not your favorite food? Actually? Um, it's My not. No. Just, no. You're the odd man out. I might be. I mean, I like pizza, but I don't eat it a lot. And when we do order it, I do have a favorite pizza. But how would you describe yourself yeah. in terms of food? Yeah. Man, that's interesting, man. Golly. Interesting question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard. Like, describe it. And now I'm thinking in it. You, you, when you drill it down the way yeah. you do, I go, maybe it's not a food. It's just... In terms. Like, in terms of food. Like, you just did, like, thaw. Mm. So, I mean, how would I describe myself? Huh. I I don't know. This is a hard question. Nobody ever asked me. I usually just get to listen. Has anyone pulled this question before? No, it's never come out before. But it it does say it it almost could be a really interesting thought experiment to, like, sit down and go, okay, what are some of the terms? Like, for me... Then I have to sit there and go, oh, well, wait. then... Uh, yeah, I'm having do, a realization. What that, do I think okay. about me? No, share, what please. Is it? I'm, it, it, that you nailed it. That in terms of food means like spicy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, those are food... Just, what are food terms? <laughs> food terms. I, I don't cook not very much. Food. <laughs> None of us do. We all okay. eat pizza. Well, <laughs> this is wonderful. This is wonderful inner critic. <laughs> oh, the most so it's perplexing like spicy, question in the bowl. Um, salty, 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 crunchy, tough, too yeah. hot, burnt. Yeah. What would yeah. you say? But yeah, that's a good. I don't know. I mean, then I'm, now it gets into the territory from that perspective of what do I think about myself? Exactly. And good so, question. boy, I mean, I've got to first describe myself, how I think of myself, and that's a lot of ingredients. I think so I, many ingredients. Yeah. So like sometimes I think Look. I can. Here we go. Yeah. I've heard <laughs> Okay, so I, I think I can try this from that perspective. I think sometimes I come in um, hot and cold. Yeah, I can be a little hot and a little cold and a little warm. That's a little vague in general. That's pretty vague. <laughs> Food, okay, okay, okay. He's both. Yeah. Um, I can. I think you, with me, there's, uh, there's only so many bites you can take before oh. you're full. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I, like people, I think I'm one of those meals that maybe you can have some. But 
you go, ooh, I, I, I think I want to order this plate of food, Orin, this 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 meal of Orin, and then I get a few <laughs> bites in, and I'm like, okay, I've had a bite of the mashed potatoes, I've had a bite of the peas, I've had a slice of the turkey, and a little bit of the salad, and I'm kind of done. So That's how I would describe so hearty. rich, hearty, rich, mm-hmm. yeah. rich, maybe, and maybe some people just go that. I thought I, I, my eyes were bigger than my stomach. Mm. <laughs> I want, thought I wanted to eat this whole meal, but I don't think I want to eat this whole meal. That's Rich. a little sad. I don't know. I think it's, I think, um, hmm. It's filling. Perhaps. The food you described, like potatoes. Maybe and, we could reframe it to say you only yeah. need just a little bit. Yeah, to, be just, yeah, to yeah, get I think, your needs met. Yeah. yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. And I'm, at, I'm going from my own perspective, the way I perceive myself. I mean, I... I can run hot, I guess, is what I always tell my wife. I said, oh, I run hot. Once you get me going, like, I think I can overwhelm people. I think I can be a bit much. So you don't need the whole plate. You don't or, need much. You need, I can, there's going to be leftovers. A little bit. Some does, for the fridge. Yeah, a some little for, goes a long way. Yeah. So there's yeah. my food. That's the best I can do. Yeah. Good question. That is interesting. Good question, caller. Amazing. All right, Elizabeth. Now it's me. Yep. Thank you. We're passing the ball. Please don't pick the second <laughs> one. I don't know. Let's we'll see. More food questions. <laughs> it's been selected. <laughs> Have you av- ever asked yourself why you don't do the things you know you should be doing? Oh, oh my God. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Who the heck are the- you? <laughs> I'm, I'm like you think you're better than me? <laughs> Well, so I live in this a lot. Actually, you know, the more and more I've gotten involved in this this coaching world in ontology, it's about being an observer of yourself and why you are doing this or aren't doing this. And man, I can stay stuck in this train of thought for hours and get lost in not moving, mm, you know, moving yeah. forward and doing the things that I need to. Um, there's so many things like I have so many ideas about stuff related to to booty yoga or yoga or coaching and you know I talk like website development and all yeah, these yeah. ideas of stuff that I've got going on and um, some of them don't come into action so you know let's quit why are you not doing this what is it that's holding you back um, what action steps do you need to take who do you need to reach out to you know and I live in these questions all the time but sometimes that is what's keeping me from actually mm-hmm. <laughs> taking the steps to, to do those things so um, yeah. Have I ever asked yourself? I would say like 10 times a day. I yes, probably <laughs> am, am in that mindset. Is there like one thing in there though? Like one that you just, that stands out to like this one recurs a lot. Like this is something I, I always, uh, I always say I want to do this. I always, I always have this idea and I always don't do it. Well, so I can use the one in relation to you. You helped me with some of the ideas for like website and like branding stuff. Oh yeah, and our conversation we had, yeah. So I was stuck on that for a long time. Like I have a friend who's going to develop it for me and just not taking any action. And one of the last weekends of my workshop, um, I realized that I was not taking any action and trying to figure out why I was not. Um, and I don't know the why as to why I was not, but I decided I needed to make a plan to do something to move forward. And so I called you to set an appointment um, and we talked and so that that has snowballed into to more things happening. So that's just one recent thing um, yeah. why that's not happening. I think in general, I would say like fear of failure is like a big thing for me is what holds me back from from doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of switching, you know, this workshop we did yesterday, this movement workshop was kind of like, I have this idea, I just want to do it, even if it fails and no one's there, I'm just going to really jump cool on looking, it. by the way. Some it was a lot of fun. It was awesome, yeah. Um, and so there's lots of things that can come out of that. So it's just, um, I would say the root of that is usually like a fear of failure for me. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting question. It mm-hmm. really is. I, I wonder about that because I, I, I wonder if I have a, it's the fear of failure. Mine might be a little different. I think there's other things for me that keep me from moving forward. It's an interesting toy because I feel like it's like a uh, seesaw. Like I feel like I can create and do whatever it is I put my mind to. But then I also have this, you know, that talk that's mm-hmm. there that keeps me, you know, kind of seesawing between actual movement. And so that's a struggle for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What can about? I to, can I see the question, please? Yeah. Oh my lord. Yeah. Get down to the details of the words. What about you, Rosie? Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Definitely. Can you repeat the question? Please? Absolutely. I was, I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> I was really. I was gonna just do it, but now that you've asked, 
Here's the question. Please. Have you ever asked yourself why you don't do the things you know you should be doing? Uh, you know, I think I'm going to swing this back around to the food question. Okay. Um, to, to describe, I every day I write down a list of uh, 10 things, 10 goals that I want to happen. In that day or just in general? In general. Okay. So, like, in my life. And as they happen, like, I'll scratch them off. Like, graduating with massage school, scratch that off. Like, add something new. Um, one of the things that's in there every day is to cook nourishing food for my family. For whatever reason, I just cannot do it. I think it probably has to do with my eating disorder. Like, just not really wanting to feed myself. So, then how am I going to feed my kids and my, it's not I don't like starve them or anything you know like they eat but you know we go to McDonald's and we you know eat hot dogs and pizza frozen and stuff and so it's that's been a real barrier for me so every day I do ask myself like what why can't I do this? Like, why is it so hard? Because mm-hmm. people do it. Like, what's innately wrong with me that mm. I cannot? Mm-hmm. Like, I just can't go get the ingredients. Like, I cannot make myself do it. And I will. I know I'll get there. And I feel like, you know, there's just kind of a lot going on. But, of course, like I said, with meditation, like, I could use that as an excuse all mm-hmm. day long. Anything is an excuse. Um, but I do feel that that... Uh, that's something I just I'm really struggling with mm. a lot but I think that has to do with healing my eating disorder mm-hmm. and just my thoughts about like do I really need do I deserve you know to be nourished and fed and you know healthy so. can I share something with you sure. I mean it's just I don't know I'm listening to you and I go you know this is something I just feel like it's for you to hear I um I only cook in cast iron and I started doing that many years ago after I uh heard on a uh, show called Raw Craft with Anthony Bourdain. He went to a cast iron skillet factory. Well, actually, I had started before that, but after I saw that episode, I was like, oh my gosh, this is why I'm cooking cast iron. Mm -hmm. Um, He went to this cast iron skillet uh, manufacturing place and he was talking about cast iron in general and the history of it and he said you know um, they talking about iron walks and he's talking about the word walk and what it means is actually the wake in the iron pot is that it actually retain they believe that it retains the energy because you know the molecules and the oils mm-hmm. you know with cast iron you you never wash it right you know you always just kind of clean it with water and salt and then you oil it down and so there's always when you cook oily things in their meals there's always just something happening to the iron. And he said, there's cast iron pots that go back, you know, thousands of years. And they like have the wake of every meal that's ever been made for somebody in there. And boy, I just loved that. And so when my father passed away, um, I had to cook a meal for the wake. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go buy a pot today, a new iron pot. And the first meal I'm going to cook in it is going to be the meal that I cook for the people who are going to eat to celebrate my father's life. And so that's what I did. And I've cooked many meals in that pot since, but it has changed the way I think when I cook now. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I'm not saying it's like, oh, some big meditative experience, but every meal I cook in those pots and pans, when I'm gone, those pots and pans are going to still be there. And someone, hopefully in my family, my children will take one or the other or whatever. But every time they cook another meal, the wake the love, whatever I cooked. It doesn't have to even have to be healthy, but it did change the way I think about cooking. It was like, now it's almost like a motivation to put something into this pot. And now there's like this almost, I don't want to call it a ghost, but like a spirit in the pot. Well, it's like a sacred, holy yeah. Yeah. ritual kind yeah. of thing. You know? And I, I think you know, that's and cool. It, did, <laughs> it just changed the way I thought about the mm-hmm. way I cook. So I don't always cook a healthy meal for my kids. But when I do, I try to do it in one of those pots. And it's like I at least begin the process of like making a thing. And once I made a thing out of it, it became more stable and more solid. And now when I look at those pots and pans, I don't go, uh, hand me a skillet. It's like, oh, no, that's an iron there's skillet. Meaning. There's a meaning in that's this thing. That's cool. I like that. I don't know. I just felt like it was relevant to some yeah. of what you were saying. Yeah. Okay, can I go now? You can. Sorry. (laughs) I just stole your... (laughs) I'm so ready for this question. Absolutely. What you got? (laughs) Absolutely love this question, by the way. I wish I knew who wrote this question. And here it is. Have you ever asked yourself why you don't do the things you know you should be doing? I just love that. It's brilliant. Here's the answer. Because there's a voice inside my head that's saying... You should be doing the things that you should be doing. That's the reason why I don't do them. 
I get really excited about this. This voice is the inner critic. This is the voice of something called the inner critic that we all struggle with. A voice that's telling me all the time, you should be doing more. You should be cooking all the time. Mm-hmm. You should be doing a podcast. You should have worked out today. <laughs> you should not have eaten those donuts today. You should be taking time for yourself on a Sunday. So this is the inner critic, and this question is just so brilliant because it just lets that thing out of the bag. Here's how we respond to this type of question. Yes, I hear this all the time. Why aren't you doing the things you should be doing? And the answer is, I have a right to never do the things I should be doing. Mm, I like Uh. that. And that will set me free. It doesn't mean I'm never going to do the things that are good, the things that I like to do, that I want to do. But the very act of a voice inside of me that says, you should be doing something, is the voice that will park me on a couch for three hours. Interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. Immobilized. Shooting on because yourself. Because I'm going to do it whenever I want to do it. <laughs> and not when my should voice tells me I should be doing it. And yeah. that kind of rebellion is something that's uh, very immediate with me. So I respond to my inner critic with defiance. Oh, wow. You see how that works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a right to do the things I should be doing or the things I want to do. And I have a right to never do anything Mm -hmm. I should do ever again. And I'm still a good person. Because at the end of every should statement is this. You should be doing the things that you should be doing. And if not, you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. What kind of person doesn't do the things that they should be doing? Yeah. Bad people. Mm-hmm. inferior people mm-hmm. this is a brilliant brilliant question i love it so much well and you know and that should what should a person be doing can be different depending on who you talk to right i mean somebody else could look and go you know paul let me go look at your life real quick <laughs> and yeah. tell you all the things that from my perspective people love doing that you should be doing yeah. and that happens all the time i'm friends with a lot of people yeah. like that i mean i do that i mean you go um, you can pick it. I mean, pick the thing. You, we should. You should be driving an electric car. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. should be driving an electric you car. You should <laughs> be on a hundred percent vegan diet. You should. You know. You just go. Everybody's got a. You didn't something. tell me my should. I don't know what it. Oh, I didn't. Nothing. You should be now. cooking dinner yeah. every night. <laughs> you should be cooking in a cast iron All skillet. Right. Yeah, you should go and buy a cast iron skillet yeah. right now. I have one. Well, it's interesting. You. We brought up the word should earlier, I think something that you said. And um, in my coaching world, we're like, anytime you hear the word should, look at your standards. And where is that coming up? And are those your standards or are those someone else's standards that you're living to? Oh, yeah. Did they just sort of evolve into your way of being and you didn't even know? And, and there's so many people, myself included, that never look at what are my standards for yeah, exercise? What right. are my standards for whatever it is? And am I doing it for me or um, for someone else and living to their standards? So yeah. should a good It's a a critical voice, and if I'm doing exercise or anything that I love, in response to a critical voice, it will rob the love that you had for that thing. That's true. If all of a sudden I should be doing yoga all the time, that will rob you of your passion for yoga. Mm -hmm. I promise you that because I see it all the time, and I've experienced it, and it's terrible. So how do you shut it up? I have a right to blank, and I'm still a good person. I have a right to do yoga because I love it. I have a right to take a day off. Okay. It's a response. So have you ever asked yourself why you don't do the things you should be doing? I have a right to never do the things I should be doing ever again. Yeah. It's just a releasing statement to the inner critic. So this is an anthetics therapy kind of thing. So it's you want to disarm the inner critic, take its power away, which is in its guilt. The guilt yeah. is you're not doing the thing, and you should feel guilty for that. Right? No. I have a right to. Be a little bit more selfish. and Can you write that down for me before we leave? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can write that down for you. That. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I, I guess it kind of makes me, oddly enough, it makes me think of Lent a little bit. Uh, because, I mean, yeah. Lent is that time of year where you go, okay, I'm going to make some sacrifices, right? Well, okay, I said the word. I'm going to make some sacrifices. <laughs> and that and immediately, like, <laughs> triggers something. And it's like, oh, I'm going to be fine. I mean, for me, like, I'll tell you, like, me, it was, um, I'm going to go 100% vegetarian instead of flexitarian f- during Lent. And then on Fridays, I'm going to do a full fast. You know, no food, just water. Um, and I'm not going to eat after 6 o'clock. That was it. I was like, that's going to be my regimen. That's what I'm going to do. And it usually, this is every Lent. It turns into what you're talking about right there. It turns into, 
I'm enjoying this. Man, I like doing this. I'm going to do this for the rest. I some many every Lent. I go, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I think I can do this for the rest of my life. This is going to be the way I live now. <laughs> and then week three, it's like, well, man, why am I doing this? And why do I have to? Is And then I start to, the voice of like, I'm being told to. And, and even though it's not coming out that way, there's just some voice of dissent that just kicks mm-hmm. in. And it's mm-hmm. like, you know what? I am going to eat tonight after six because it's convenient and mm-hmm. I didn't get to eat lunch and it's six o'clock and I'm hungry and you know, it doesn't make any sense. And I don't know, just begin the reasoning with that whole thing. It's just very similar to what you're describing. Yeah. I was going to say for Lynn, I have the same experience. Cause I was like, I'm going to give up Netflix and not watch any sort of TV no. at all. Cause I'm how many hours at night am I wasting? And I have all of these things. I just said that I'm trying to develop and I could be doing this in this time. And so I was like, no Netflix at all. And then I realized that that was just not <laughs> practical well, or that I wanted to. And so I was like, as long as I've done something, yeah. <laughs> you know, or if I'm tired and I've worked 12 hour day, like I'm going to let myself just like veg out on a couple yeah. hours of Netflix and not be so rigid or it's a, the, the, sh- the, inner critic voice is rigid and riddled with guilt there are punishments behind it so i have a right to abstain from netflix for as long as i want yeah and i'm still a good person i have this experience where i wanted to go into work on a saturday like okay i want to go like there's things i want to do but my inner critic says well you shouldn't have to go to work on a Saturday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're going, you know what? You're right. I should be able to do whatever I want on a Saturday. Right. And even though I know in my head somewhere that if I go into work, it's going to take an hour, that's it, and it's going to make me feel great for the rest of the week, and it's going to be very useful, this act of defiance against a should is keeping me from doing that. Mm-hmm. Even things that I love or things that I don't want to do, it can just take that away. It's so yeah. brilliant. It's such a brilliant thing. Yeah, it is, and it's interesting. Can it it's change? Good. It takes sacred, like sacred, holy things, and like turns them on their oh, head a lot yeah. of times. Especially like the whole Lenten practices. It's like, man, oh yeah, you should only every drink. year. You happens. said you were only going to drink water, and you said it on a podcast, <laughs> right? So you right. should absolutely stick with that because what kind of person doesn't says it stick on a to podcast. right? Yeah. Right. Well, and right, exactly. <laughs> and then what? you can live with that guilt. Yeah. You know? Right. It's a guilt feeling. I have a right to change my plans yeah. at any moment, and I'm still a good person. Yeah. See, I have to. I, that, that every year I struggle with what to, what I want to put out there that I want to practice for anything mm. because I go, well, what is my ultimate goal here? I have to always ask myself that. Like, why am I doing anything? Anything that I do, and it, and I try to drill into the high idea. And for me. That ultimate high idea that I always come back to is I honestly want to be more compassionate. Hmm. I really do. Like, that's if I get to live a long life, that told my wife that the other day. I said, I read an obituary. I'll just tell you, I read an obituary for somebody the other day that I've, I've known for a lot of years. And there's no, there's no right way to write an obituary. But when I read it, I was like, you know, I don't want this. I don't want when I'm gone to say Oren worked here and Oren worked there and he had this title and that title and and he was loved in the end. I was like, I, I'd rather not that. And I told my wife this. I said, I don't know why that's bugging me. This obituary is bugging me for some reason. It's like stinging me. Every time I read it and I keep going, I don't want to read. They were, they lived a compassionate life. They were compassionate to people. They were kind to people. They treated people well, and they're and because they did, they were well thought of, mm-hmm. for whatever that matters. But and generated some kind of compassionate works. And I was like, that's I, I think that's what I want, right? Where am I going with this? Well, that's more the person that you are than the like who you are as personal versus what you do. What I do, right? It's something like I go, yeah. So I did these things and I had these titles and I wore these hats, but I don't know if I really want to be celebrated for that. You know, where am I? Where am I going with this? Where are we talking about? I just went way off into outer well, space. No, but it's, it's, I mean, I, it's the same. It's identity. You know, it's you. You are who you are, not what you do. But you, then you have to do. You have to like, do. That's, that's what I was getting. Yeah. That you just like brought me back home. Okay, no problem. Talking to thank you for that. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is like with Lenten practices, I have to remind myself sometimes. Okay, why am I doing these Lenten practices? And that sometimes becomes almost my inner critic. Mm. I'll go, well, am I doing this to generate that person? Is what I'm doing 
this Lenten practice for to become more compassionate or am I doing it for another reason? Mm -hmm. And when I start to dig into the reason for doing it, I go, well, okay, then this thing I'm doing is not actually, this doesn't serve that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not serving that. Me not eating all day Friday isn't serving that. Does it make you more compassionate? It doesn't make me more Definitely compassionate at all. Make you more compassionate. I, I discovered this a couple of weeks ago. I was It was Friday morning and, you know, it's my fasting day. And I had stopped at um, Kroger to get some stuff for the office. There was a man out front. It was cold morning. And you could he was just homeless, right? I mean, I don't know the way to put it. He was just homeless and he looked like he could use a cup of coffee and, a, and breakfast. And so... I just, I don't know. I just felt sorry for the man. I was like, he's just sitting here shivering on the ground. He looks kind of miserable. And I, so I went in and I bought him a cup of coffee. I bought um, and a gift card to the Starbucks. I know they have a little breakfast stuff in there. And I went outside and I said, hey, why don't you go in, have a cup of coffee and eat breakfast? And he was like, thank you so much. And I'm not telling the story like, oh, I did something nice. I felt my heart open up. I felt like that part of me like, come to life. And I was like, oh, I love this person me fasting today isn't even Mm -hmm. about that has nothing to do with it Mm -hmm. and so that's the more my inner critic it it comes in and goes is this serving that or you what are you doing this for what you're saying brings up to me the have do be versus be do have um if i said that right um a lot of times we live from um what's better to live from be the person you want to be then you'll do the things then you'll have the things that you want a lot of times we were like, we need to have the things that we want to do the things yeah. that we want to do. Then okay. we'll be the person we mm-hmm. want to be. So does that make sense? Am yeah. I explaining that yeah, right? Yeah. So be compassionate will lead you to do the things that make you compassionate. Right. And then you'll have those things. So living in compassion, had you do the buying the food, you know, the gift card for yeah. the man. And I want more of that. Yeah. So why? So right. If I'm going to do a practice, I would rather do practices that lead me towards that. And who knows? I might be wrong. Maybe that fasting was doing that and I just wasn't aware. Who knows? But it didn't feel like it was connected. It felt like it was disconnected. I felt like it became a should hmm. and it wasn't serving mm-hmm. that. And I was like, well, okay, why am I doing any Lenten practice at all? Isn't it? Well, I'll tell you, for me, it's got to do with what I believe about Jesus and Christ and compassion and having a, a a burning heart and I go so if that's what I believe and that's what I'm trying to draw towards and I'm doing Lent because of anything for Lent because of that shouldn't I be doing practices that are leading towards that I don't know and it gets real complicated for me <laughs> so then I then I go then but then sometimes I go am I just using this to justify me being lazy with my Lenten practice. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? And it becomes mm-hmm. like this sort of thing. And I don't know, it's just stuff going on in your head. About yeah. So I, I live there too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a question for the therapist in the room. Um, kind of going back to that, but like on a more surfacey level. Um, okay. So if I, I'm trying to distinguish now in my life that I'm trying to heal from this, you know, bulimic anorexic way of living, which is like feast or famine. When I want, when I decide I'm going to go exercise, I'm trying to discern whether it's because I'm punishing myself for eating four donuts this morning, or if it's because I like the way I feel when I run, Mm -hmm. you know, like if I'm going to go do yoga because I'm punishing myself for, it's so hard for me to figure out like Mm -hmm. where that is coming from. Cause I want it to be from a place that is like kind to myself, but I just don't know, Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of that has to do with the inner critic, Mm -hmm. like, because that's been such, that's been the loudest voice in my head for forever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the loudest voice in all of our heads. Um, but how do you know and how do you like act on that? Yeah. I mean, so your feeling states as you get more and more in touch with them are your clue. So an inner critic message is always loaded with a dose of guilt, shame, or defectiveness. Okay. And if you don't obey your inner critic shoulds, you you get hit with that little zap of guilt, shame, or defectiveness. Now that sounds like it's tied up with also my desire to get fit and feel good and i have that too like i like working out and i struggle with am i doing it too much yeah um i'd like to rest today because i've worked out five days in a row crossfit Mm -hmm. and like my brain knows it's unhealthy but i don't want to stop type deal 
So it's hard for me to take a day off. Yeah. My inner critic will say, you should get up and work out today when I'll know it's a rest day, Paul. Like, come yeah. on. So it's a very delicate thing to really listen to who wants me to work out today? What message is going to leave me feel, you know, if I show up at the gym, am I going to feel guilty and miserable? Or if I stay on the couch, am I going to feel guilty and miserable? Just kind of looking at that. Oftentimes, just saying, I have a right to go work out today, and I'm still a good person. And I have a right to never work work out out again, again. ever again, and I'm still a good person. (laughs) Suddenly, the decision gets easier, but it's remembering to do that. Okay. That's, That's harder. Mm. I like that. Mm-hmm. I struggle with that too. I, I was anorexic in like middle school age, oh, wow. and so okay. switched to like extra exercise type, you know, bulimia in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now, because I'm, I'm in fitness a lot, and so the struggle is: Am I doing this to force myself into some behavior because I want to like make myself feel bad about this, or am I really tired and should I really rest today? And so that's a struggle that I have to sit with, and it's just really. Um, like what he said, sitting and seeing what, what's the come from from that, and what what is my body really telling me? And um, I like so. that. I like that um, that term. What's the come from? I guess you got that from your training. Yeah. But that's really I like that a lot. Like, what's the source? Where is it coming from? Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you just have to. It's it's just a day by day, hour by hour thing mm-hmm. that you have to look at and just delineate kind of where it's coming. I would I would want you to in that moment say I have a right to. Mm-hmm. Blank. Yeah, and just see which one feels great. Okay, you know, okay. and I like what you said, Paul, about knowing if it's if the shame, if it's shame and guilt that mm-hmm. you're feeling as a result of it, is mm-hmm. a good driver yeah. or indicator mm-hmm. of what. Yeah, where is me going to work out today something I'm doing to to ward off yes. shame and guilt? Hmm. Okay, and if so, the answer for me is mm, no, no. But maybe you just need to say, I have a right to go you know yeah who knows or i never have to do it again ever. yeah there's free liberating there's, see, yeah after, that's very liberating you I must like that. feel it if you like it you yeah seem to like it oh yeah so oftentimes you can feel that freedom immediately and go yeah. oh that feels good yeah i'm gonna go to the gym this is fun because I, I, I so identify with the the rebel you know you're just yeah. like uh-uh, uh-uh. nope yeah. And yeah you you see how the rebel can work in both ways yes yeah. i do yeah yes yeah God, that's definitely me too. With not not with those things, but with other things, my wife would definitely say that about me. Like if somebody sticks me into a situation where I have to make a decision now, the rebel, I mean, rises up really big and fast and says, "Then the answer is always no." <laughs> always, yeah, no. I get that. I get that. <laughs> it's always no. I mean, if I have to answer now, it's no. And I used to not. I think that comes from we. You said what did what's the come from? Where does mm-hmm. it come from? Is that kind of where yeah. that gets in? We've been having this conversation lately because I've. I don't know if I talked to one of y'all about this, but I'm deaf in my left ear or mostly deaf, and so I have this thing that I do, especially when we go out to eat places, and it's been there for years. And I've always I've I've been trying to determine what causes this. And my wife said you're very good at like assessing a room. What's like a potentially volatile situation you're very good at like um skirting around that type of stuff because you're watching it and i said yeah but it's it's kind of frustrating too because i can't ever really be present when i get especially when i get into um larger rooms full of lots of people but one thing she pointed out is that when we go out to eat you're distracted she says your 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 attention is something's going on across the restaurant there's an altercation potentially taking place you'll you'll tell me like did you hear did you see did you go it's always like somebody's frustrated with a waiter or somebody's getting a little too loud somebody's acting a little their mannerisms because you are like so tuned into that that i don't even worry Mm -hmm. i just kind of settle in and go or i'll catch that because he's very good at that. And I said, yeah, I am, but I don't know if that's something I want to be proud of. I said, because it's quite frustrating. So I started digging into where does it come from? Because it doesn't, I've called it like, oh, I have this, I said, the way we talk about it is like, it's a gift. Like, oh, you're good at that. Mm -hmm. You're good at that. And I'm like, I'm kind of sick of being good at that (laughs) because it's not a happy thing. It's a negative thing. So I thought I had to do it with my hearing. I started sitting different positions, right? I was like, maybe because for the bulk of my life, all of my attention is sort of here. And so if I'm sitting in a restaurant or in a position that I'm hearing things over here and not acoustically, right, or Mm -hmm. stereo, 
But then we got in a conversation the other day, and I said, you know, I was talking about my father, and I said, you know, yeah, dad was always... I started talking about how terrified we were, I was, as a young man, to go out to eat with my dad because he was very volatile. If his steak wasn't cooked just right or if they didn't put what he wanted in his hamburger, name it, he would blow up. And it was always these altercations that kept happening, and he would get real aggressive and blow up and get loud, and he wanted everybody to see. And the more I talked about that, the more I was like, here's the come from. Mm -hmm. This comes from me now as an adult and the way I am functioning in these cert these particular places is coming from, as a child, always going that anxiety of, okay, we're going out to eat tonight. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Please cook his food right. Please make oh sure that gosh, the hamburger's got to... I mean, and I'm throwing my dad under the bus. He's not here to defend himself. Again, I'm, I'm looking at him compassionately because now I know where a lot of that comes from for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that come from is super important because I think as adults, we have to do... Again, watch the body. I'm kind of bringing it back full circle, but like, okay, now I'm getting a little sweaty. Why? Somebody's getting a little heated with a waiter, and then I'm go. My brain's going all the way back to Bonanza, and somebody, yeah. my dad's steak was a little too, you know, yes. pink, and flipping the tape, flipping the plate over, mm -hmm. and throwing his stuff on the tape, you know. Well, the way our brains work is like whatever we're thinking is what we see in the world, right? So like, you know, if you're looking for a new car or something, you tend to see that car driving, you know, all over. When I bought my right. Jeep, all I saw were Jeeps everywhere. Right. Um, and so the same with thinking, like if if you're thinking about the aggression or the anger that your dad have, you're going to you're going to notice that in every setting that yeah. you are because that's what you're paying attention to and I'm versus not consciously correlating it and then all no, of a sudden and not aware oh, of it. Yeah. And your wife doesn't have that, yeah. you know, in her brain, so she's not watching for that. So yeah. it's just interesting how yeah, it's How really makes us strange. behave in the world. It is. I mean, and, and a lot of that's just in there. And if you're not looking at it, it's just affecting you. And, and many of us are out here in the world just walking around making autopilot. Autopilot. That's why I told her, I said, think about all the decisions you make every day and all the things you're doing everywhere you go, the people you're engaging with, the meetings you choose to take or not take. How many of those decisions, if you're not really digging, are you making based on old shit mm -hmm. that ain't got nothing to do with what you're doing right now? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's just stuff stuck in there. This was fun. It's great. Yeah. Did y'all have fun? Yeah, I did. Fun. We laughed. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think people will really enjoy this. What about the mixtape part? Listening Loved to yourself. Yeah. Did y'all like that? Loved it. Yeah, it was kind of nerve wracking, but I know. Uh, but I liked it. Yeah, I did too. I think this was right on. This show has been sort of organic in that way. Um, you know, you 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 bring people in. You don't know what you're going to get, and then now that we're getting into it, I mean, it's getting on the 40 plus episodes soon, That's and awesome. you're just going, "Wow, you know, this thing's really turning into something." Mm -hmm. And happy accidents are happening. I had a guest um, come on the show, and we had our cell phones on the table, and somehow we started picking up a signal. This whole table turned into like a, a, a radio tower and we were picking up an emergency alert signal, but we couldn't mm. hear it when we were recording. And so when we went back and listened to the audio, it was all blown because it was a signal was running through it. Oh, wow. We fixed all that because I, I, it was something new. It was a glass tabletop, all these arms and mm -hmm. stuff. So anyway, I said, well, look, your whole episode, like we had this deep <laughs> oh my conversation God. and I go, look, yikes, the whole thing's blown. I can't even air it. So I was like, so to, you know, and this person kind of came from far away. <laughs> so it was like a soup of problems. I mean, I've got to tell them, thanks for coming and crying at my table <laughs> with me, but now I can't air this thing. So what are we going to do? And I can't, I didn't want to ask them to come back because of the distance of where I'm right around the street. And so I said, well, you know, I came up with the idea. I said, well, I think I'd like to start trying to do some episodes where I go to someone else's environment. Oh, cool. mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe I come to you, make it up to you. We'll go to a place that's special to you. You know, and so she liked the idea of that. So I'm going to be going to her and we're going to do the show in a different environment. Cool. Better. And just see what happens from there. And I said, you know, we'll call them road trip episodes. So it's like now we're going to be doing that as a regular thing. Like, OK, we'll That's go cool. places now. It'll be interesting, too, for, from your perspective to see how that yeah. shifts the way that. Yeah, right. Not being goes. in here. Because yeah. in here, it's my safe space. Mm -hmm. I'm asking other people to come in here and bring their, I'm nervous, I don't know what's going to happen to my safe space. And I'm over here going, ha ha, I'm totally fine. I've done this 40 <laughs> times, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. It's just interesting. And so I do, I, I don't know, I guess I tell you all that to 
to mean that I do appreciate y'all being a part of this experiment. Glad because it, it yeah. is. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. I was so excited to meet y'all. Me too. Watch y'all's pod or listen to your podcast before we came on. So it was exciting yeah. to see you in person. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> how does that feel to like hear it? Because I haven't had that happen yet. Like, how does it feel to listen to somebody's podcast and then come in and meet them? Like, you, you know, just, you know, you listen to Rosie's mm-hmm. and you said you listen to theirs. So it's like, I'll listen to theirs. Well, I think it's that vulnerability piece that we were talking about. You know, yeah. you're, they're talking and you're, you're being open with who you are. So you feel connected with that person before yeah. you meet them. So yeah. it's, um, I don't know. Uh, it's like it's a gateway. To, yeah. You know, it's kind of already a gateway. And Paul and I have grown up together. Did y'all? Much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we didn't say that. For, we did. No, well, we're, we're still, we're, we're we're still recording. Like, y'all, you guys know each other. So I, I need to leave soon, but can I tell a Rosie story really oh quickly? Oh, Lord, yes, This please. is kind of funny. So this speaks to our history together. I, I don't know what grade it is. Now. You should be scared. <gasps> I used to have a huge crush on Rosie what? in, like, the fifth grade. <laughs> well, that's... What? That wasn't that long ago. Oh, <laughs> you didn't miss Tried to call your house and you just like denied my phone call. In, no. Period. What? End of story. Gosh. Oh man. So we've known each other. Might have ended up elsewhere if I'd have yeah. known that. No telling. <laughs> Who knows? Wow. So we've known yeah. each other since like elementary. She's oh, wow. old. She's like maybe right. a grade or two older. Yeah, I'm a grade older. Yeah. Than you. I think we're the same age, but I'm a grade older than you. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize y'all knew each other. Yeah, Super our, fun. My brothers play music with him. So yeah. Is, did yeah. Oh okay. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. right. 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 So yeah. it's one of my first ever like denials. Thank you for that. <gasps> You're wonderful so learning welcome. experience. I appreciate I probably that. Probably owe you a lot for therapy and stuff. <laughs> if Rosie could go back, when in you time wanted to get yeah, about something. what you could change, <laughs> change. Uh, <laughs> if I could go back into the future, <laughs> she would take that phone call. Give me that call. question back. <laughs> yeah. no, now funny. that I know that I did that, I would go back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, thanks take for having us. Really, yeah, really yeah, this is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it's just, been great. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. I yeah, it was fun. I love just as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Find the Good News. If you would like to advertise on this show or sponsor an episode, just visit findthegood.news. Send me a message and we'll see about getting your business, organization, service, product, or event on the show. I deeply thank each of you again for supporting this podcast.